thank you very much. I think that we can uh, we can start, and uh, I will give the floor to our today's moderator of the first session, uh, Grigory Lukyanov, from the High School of Economics, and uh, he is an expert of the Russian International Affairs Council to moderate this today's discussion. Uh, Grigory, Pavelski. Okay, thank you, Ruslan. Uh, dear colleagues, dear guests, we are glad to see you here on the Joint Russian International Affairs Council and Egyptian Council for Foreign Affairs Roundtable, uh, devoted to a very important theme of uh, Russian-Egyptian cooperation, uh, challenges and prospects, uh, which uh, will be devoted on a um, few parts. We have two sessions, two sessions uh, uh, for today, and also we have not only a discussion of on a very important themes, but also we have a good opportunity uh, to present and discuss a uh, first uh, joint um, report, a joint uh, REAC and ECFA uh, report, uh, political risks for Russian-Egyptian cooperation in North Africa. So it's a very good basis for talking when we have also a paper which is uh, which can be uh, some kind of a basis for the discussion, a start point for a discussion, but also we have a great number of uh, well-experienced uh, experts uh, who are also very interesting for us, and we uh, we have a great opportunity to listen to them, to their uh, opinion, their views about uh, the most important issues of Russian-Egyptian uh, cooperation in different uh, points of uh, regional uh, and international agenda. So, um, first of all, I would like to give an opportunity uh, to say a few words uh, to uh, directors. And first of all, to Andrei Kortunov, who is a director general of REAC. So, Andrei Vadimich, uh, you are welcome, please. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it is definitely not only my honor, but also my pleasure uh, to open uh, the roundtable which was organized by the Russian International Affairs Council uh, together uh, with the Egyptian Council for Foreign Affairs. Uh, to some extent, I think it's fair to say that uh, uh, we are very similar as institutions. Uh, we uh, have similar composition of our membership. And uh, I think that we also have similar ambitions. And uh, it is always nice to talk uh, to our Egyptians, Egyptian partners and uh, colleagues. Uh, Indeed, uh, Russia and Egypt uh, are not that close to each other, uh, but definitely there are very strong bonds uh, between the intellectual communities of the two countries. Uh, there are many joint projects and uh, we are happy that uh, we can make our modest contribution uh, to this uh, uh, bilateral uh, cooperation. Uh, as it was already mentioned, uh, it's not just another workshop or a round table, but um, it's also a presentation of the joint report that we prepared together with our partner institution in Cairo. I think it's an interesting piece of work and uh, definitely uh, we are open to all comments and the potential criticism that uh, uh, this uh, paper uh, might provoke. I think that uh, the timing of its publication uh, was very important because indeed uh, right now uh, North Africa uh, is undergoing very serious changes and uh, on a more general note of course uh, we see uh, a lot of volatility uh, a lot uh, of uh, new developments uh, in the uh, MENA region at large. Uh, just uh, uh, if uh, we uh, take only this year, only the six months of 2021, we will uh, probably be in a position to, uh, uh, to, to mention at least a dozen of important events uh, in the region and outside of the region uh, that uh, contributed uh, to uh, changes uh, to developments uh, in this part of the world. 
uh, of course, we uh, observed uh, the change of the guard in the White House. I, and there are still many questions, many uncertainties about the Biden administration policies uh, towards the MENA region. Uh, not everything is clear. Uh, not uh, all the eyes are dotted. And uh, definitely that contributes uh, to the uncertainties uh, in the region itself. Uh, there were other two important elections uh, in the region, uh, elections in Israel, and uh, we saw a new government emerging there for the first time in many years. Uh, and, uh, definitely, uh, this is something that uh, uh, will uh, uh, also uh, uh, generate changes in the Israeli policies. And we already see some of these changes in Europe. Uh, maybe you will also feel them uh, in your part of the world. Uh, there were elections uh, in Iran, uh, and uh, the new leadership of President Raisi uh, will have to define its uh, regional approaches, which might be somewhat different uh, from uh, the uh, team of President Rouhani. Uh, uh, of course, uh, we also observed a new escalation uh, of uh, the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict uh, uh, that took place this year and uh, uh, that uh, creates additional complications for all of them, all of us. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we saw some relaxation of tensions between Qatar on the one hand and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates on the other. Uh, this relaxation is uh, uh, not completed. Uh, there are still many uh, questions about what will happen next in the relations between major Gulf uh, monarchies, but definitely this is uh, a new uh, development. Uh, just uh, uh, a very short time ago, we uh, could also uh, follow the new high-level uh, conference on Libya, which uh, had, I think, quite mixed results, but hopefully uh, these results will be positive rather than negative. Uh, civil war in Ethiopia, uh, definitely a new phenomenon that we should also keep in mind when we're talking about this region. I don't want to uh, uh, go on with this list, but the list is long. And I think uh, it's high time uh, 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 Egypt and Russia compare their notes uh, on the developments in the region and how uh, these developments uh, might uh, affect uh, uh, their bilateral relations and uh, their approaches uh, to uh, regional crises and uh, regional conflicts. Uh, I'll, I would like to add to that, uh, that uh, in my opinion, we should not limit ourselves only to developments in the MENA, in the MENA region, though these developments, of course, are quite important uh, and uh, deserve our attention, but we should also uh, start thinking uh, about uh, more general global trends, uh, how these trends uh, are going to affect our two countries uh, and their bilateral relations. The world uh, is uh, gradually getting out of the uh, pandemic uh, crisis, though, at least in Russia, uh, we are in the middle of the third wave of the pandemic. Uh, so it is uh, premature, to say the least, to declare victory. Uh, the fight is still on, and I think that it pandemic will be with us for some time, uh, but uh, uh, the world is also going through uh, a post-pandemic recovery, but uh, definitely we're not going to get back to where we were in uh, 2019. Uh, the world has changed uh, in many ways, and uh, I think that uh, this uh, change will continue with some acceleration in years to come. Uh, there are uh, new uh, 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 developments uh, in uh, uh, many uh, 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 in many parts of the world in terms of uh, of the economies, in terms of technological developments, and uh, again, uh, all these trends will have an impact on our two countries. I don't want to take uh, more of your time. Uh, let me just conclude with saying that uh, we at RIAC always believed that uh, this uh, line of communication between Russian and uh, uh, Egyptian intellectual communities about our former diplomats, about our academics is very important. 
and we will definitely try to pursue this cooperation further and uh, we will keep uh, Egypt on our radar screen for years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Andrei Vadimovic. Uh, you have underlined a very long uh, list of uh, very different uh, issues of uh, relations. So I suppose, I hope that uh, we'll have an opportunity to discuss some of them in details. So now I would like to give an opportunity uh, to make some welcome speech to Dr. Ezad Saad uh, Al Said, uh, who is a Director General of Egyptian Council for Foreign Affairs. Uh, Dr. Ezad Saad, you are welcome for a short uh, welcome speech, and then we will go to the first session. Please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Andrei Kortonov, REAC Director General, dear colleagues and friends, REAC experts, uh, my colleagues and friends, members of ECFA. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome our partners, the Director General and the members of the Russian International Affairs Council to this important uh, virtual symposium, which uh, we hoped uh, would take place face to face in Cairo, as we still remember the warm hospitality and the kind reception for our delegation during its successful a visit to Moscow in late October uh, 2015. Anyway, we are looking forward to the improvement of the situation uh, soon so that we can uh, reciprocate. Uh, the Egyptian-Russian relations uh, have achieved the significant successes over the past few years at all political, economic, trade, and the military levels. In this context, I would like to emphasize the strategic nature of these relations, not only in connection with the comprehensive strategic partnership agreement between our two countries, but also in the light of the fact that Russian Federation enjoys an advanced place on the Egyptian foreign policy agenda, bolstering ties with Moscow in all fields has become a constant trend in this policy, which is reflected not only by President El Sisi's regular visits to Russia since November 2013. Uh, till present, but also the expansion of cooperation prospects to include unprecedented areas such as El Daba project, uh, and also uh, in addition to the growing military cooperation uh, between our two countries. Uh, we have also uh, followed recently the outcome of the 13th session of the uh, uh, Joint Commission on Trade, Economic, Scientific, and the Technical Cooperation, which took place in Moscow. Uh, and I hope we will, we will have some time to discuss the outcome in order to uh, enhance uh, what we have achieved uh, uh, in the past few years. Uh, of course, I, I, I agree with uh, Dr. Kortonov that we should not limit ourselves with uh, uh, the MENA region. Uh, however, the agenda we received from REAC is wide enough, enough to let us talk about almost everything, including the uh, policies of the external actors in uh, our part of the world and elsewhere. Uh, and also we should not uh, 
I mean, forget uh, the uh, our bilateral relations, in particular, uh, the political aspects uh, of these relations and also uh, the uh, economic and the trade exchange, uh, which we believe uh, uh, witnessed a good improvement over the past few years. And uh, yesterday I was going through uh, an interview with the American ambassador uh, in Cairo uh, on the occasion of the 4th of July uh, uh, National Day. And I have noticed that our trade exchange with the US is uh, less 100 million than the trade exchange with the Russian Federation. Uh, uh, however, uh, we are suffering a huge deficit when it comes to uh, uh, trade in goods. Uh, so it will come uh, or it is necessary that we uh, look forward for trade and services, and I mean tourism, uh, to Egypt. This is also something that we should encourage uh, uh, our uh, authorities to do something about it, uh, taking into account that uh, uh, President Putin uh, more than a month ago uh, announced that uh, the uh, the charter flights uh, between Russia and Egypt is back. Uh, so uh, uh, to conclude, I would like to express my gratitude and appreciation to Dr. Kortonov and to React family for the initiative uh, to prepare a joint research on uh, political risks for uh, Russian-Egyptian cooperation in North Africa, a matter which I believe is very useful. And I hope we will have the opportunity to conduct additional joint researches in the future. We are looking forward to further joint cooperation with REAC in the future. Thank you. Th thank you, Dr. Zabfab. It's, uh... It's very important. It's impossible not to be agree with all you have already mentioned. Uh, so uh, I only want to uh, our discussion to be uh, such good, such it was good in its starting. So let's go to our first session. Uh, it is devoted to the theme of bilateral cooperation between Russia and Egypt in a wide um, list of aspects. We have three main uh, points for a discussion. Uh, first is devoted to the current state of Russian-Egyptian relations, especially in uh, economy, uh, military sphere, humanitarian uh, sphere, and political dialogue also. The second one is uh, the issue about Russian and Egyptian views on regional and international issues, threats, challenges and other uh, regional actors. And the third one is about prospects, prospects and challenges for this cooperation, these relations uh, between Russia and Egypt in future. I uh, want to pay attention of all our participants that we have two uh, parts in this session. First of all, it is presentation, some small reports from our colleagues. We have five speakers now. So I uh, ask, I would ask them to pay maybe 10 minutes for this uh, presentation. And then we have uh, maybe a half of an hour for a discussion and answering the questions. So our guests uh, and also the speakers from other session, the second session, uh, if they have uh, some uh, questions, you can uh, ask them. Uh, please use chat a chat in Zoom. Uh, in this way, we will not uh, forget about any question. We will, can see them and some of our experts can uh, uh, be, uh, can, we, we can answer to this um, after their presentation. So uh, first of all, uh, 
It's a great honor and pleasure for me to give a floor and microphone to Professor uh, Alexei uh, Mikhailovich Vasilyev, uh, who is an honorary president of Institute of for African Studies of Russian Academy of Sciences, who is a RASFU member and REAC member, who one of the uh, our great specialists in the history of uh, Russian. Egyptian relations and also one uh, of the participants who uh, organized this uh, relationship for the last uh, dozens of years. So, uh, Alexei Mikhailovich, you are welcome. The mic, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, is it okay with the connections? You hear me? Yeah, we we hear you. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I suppose that it is a good op opportunity for both uh, our uh, International Affairs uh, Council and Egyptian uh, counterpart to meet online because of pandemics. And uh, uh, unfortunately, I was trying for years <laughs> to, 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 to uh, uh, establish closer relations with the Egyptian counterparts. So I, I use this opportunity to welcome my old friend, His Excellency Izzat Saad. And now uh, we, are, we are meeting just online. So uh, to return to our main topics, uh, uh, look, uh, of course, uh, the situation in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, the region, uh, demands uh, more attention and more cooperation between uh, Russia and Egypt. Uh, it was said by Mr. Kortunov, and I also agree with this. Our mutual relations with Egypt are of a unique nature. I always, uh, 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 I was always writing uh, about it. And uh, I would like to stress one uh, small uh, uh, point of history that never in history an Egyptian uh, soldier was uh, 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 firing at a Russian soldier and vice versa. But on the contrary, during the war of attrition on Suez Channel, there were uh, about 100 uh, Russian uh, then the Soviet uh, 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 people killed, and I hope that sometime we'll see the memorial for them in Egypt. But at the same time, uh, we, uh, uh, it's a uh, history, but uh, for, for the moment, uh, there is a special relations, two powers so different in their history in, in their civilization, in their uh, geography, uh, they uh, have either a similar or very close views on different problems of uh, uh, international relations of the situation. And one of the reasons of this success is for Russian uh, uh, not interference uh, in uh, the Egyptians' uh, internal and external, even Egyptians' affairs, and uh, this uh, versa. Uh, well, we know how difficult period was in the Egyptian history when uh, in uh, uh, 2013 uh, there was a change of government in Egypt which was named uh, not very uh, democratic way, but on the contrary, well, in this country, when some forces are coming to power in democratic way, and if they are failing to do their job, they are not going uh, to, to get out in peaceful way. So uh, what was done in Egypt, it means that Egypt, uh, uh, did not uh, uh, experience uh, the internal civil war, but returned uh, to the uh, development uh, uh, projects, uh, which uh, 
were uh, practically stopped during the so-called um, uh, Arab Spring. Uh, uh, at the same time, uh, Russian-Egyptian uh, 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 relations uh, does not uh, 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 prevent for Egypt uh, any uh, good relations and close relation with the third uh, countries, uh, for example, with the US. And uh, today uh, we have just uh, 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 joint position on security and stability. Uh, for example, in uh, uh, the problems of Syria or uh, Libya, uh, 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 we have uh, a joint uh, attitude to the struggle against terrorism and extremism. Uh, so, uh, stabilization, uh, peace and stabilization of the situation in North Africa and generally in the Middle East, and of course against any proliferation of the weapons of uh, mass uh, destruction, nuclear, chemical, biological, and so on, and uh, some cooperation in uh, uh, cyber uh, security. We know that even uh, military cooperation between our countries uh, uh, is uh, going on. And uh, of course, uh, there were uh, uh, not only uh, uh, mutual visits and uh, uh, talks between our two leaders, but uh, 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 two against two uh, or with uh, two of uh, partners foreign minister and uh, defense minister of Russia and Egypt. And uh, that's why it was permitted for, uh, it was uh, normal for our foreign minister Lavrov, who uh, recently has visited Egypt to say that our cooperation is in uh, new uh, uh, quality. And of course, uh, the main, uh, uh, the main uh, uh, result of this uh, 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 new quality is, uh, uh, of course, uh, the Treaty of Comprehensive Partnership and Strategic Cooperation. It was uh, uh, signed in uh, uh, two and a half years ago, and uh, uh, it is uh, it was uh, uh, a working document even for Sochi uh, meetings in uh, uh, 2019 for Africa, which was presided both by, Ru by the Russian and Egyptian president. For uh, military cooperation, uh, was, of course, I am not a great specialist in, in this, and as I know, there were uh, there were joint even military maneuvers. I know that, uh, for example, uh, Mistral uh, type ships uh, uh, were provided with uh, Russian special helicopters, and uh, there were some more cooperation in uh, anti uh, uh, in uh, the. Um, uh, anti-air uh, uh, defenses, uh, but uh, very special thing. I suppose, I know that there are some uh, sort of cooperation in mutual production because uh, Egyptian industry is uh, uh, strong enough even in military uh, affairs. Well, I shall not speak about economic cooperation because uh, the next speaker, uh, Mrs. Zeiter, is a, uh, a very uh, no renowned specialist on it. And I would like to say that uh, uh, it is very important that uh, hundreds or maybe thousands of Egyptian students are studying uh, uh, at, in Russian universities and it is continuation, continuation of the old practice. And uh, at the same time, we know that even in Al-Azhar, uh, 
university at Cairo, the most prestigious religious university in the world. There are uh, not dozens, but even hundreds of uh, the uh, uh, Muslims, uh, which represent very important part of today's Russian uh, population. And of course, we know that in uh, Ayn Shams University, there is a chair of uh, uh, the Russian language and uh, uh, several uh, hundreds of, uh, of uh, uh, um, uh, students who graduate, graduated from Ayn Shams uh, could find more and more jobs because of growing of uh, uh, Russian-Egyptian uh, cooperation. I hope, as always uh, uh, in this uh, meeting, uh, uh, as anybody in this meeting is hoping, that uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, Russian tourism will be restored uh, in uh, uh, the next, in the nearest future uh, to Egypt for uh, for uh, 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 interests of uh, the uh, two sides. So, uh, of course, there is a lot uh, to speak about our uh, 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 mutual cooperation and possibilities to, 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 uh, uh, to uh, influence uh, the developments in positive way both in North Africa and middle, the Middle East in general. And uh, you see, sometimes uh, there are opinions that Egypt uh, uh, now is not as big and important a leader of the Arab world as it was uh, some dozens of years ago. Even if it is so, though it is question of discussion, I am sure uh, in the future of Egypt, in the, in, in the future of uh, its uh, great role as a le leader in, uh, uh, of the Arab world. And of course, this uh, task, uh, this goal is uh, only not only Egyptian goal, but also Russian goal. So we, uh, I, 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 am, I understand that uh, uh, future cooperation between our countries will serve uh, will serve uh, 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 interests of Russia and Egypt, and will uh, uh, serve the interests of uh, uh, peace uh, and stability in the region. Thank you. For attention. Thanks a lot, Alexey Mikhailovich. It's uh, it's very interesting. Uh, you have uh, underlined uh, a, a very important uh, issue. So uh, now I would like to uh, invite uh, to our discussion uh, again Dr. Assad. Uh, I would like to invite him uh, to share uh, his valuable assertive opinions on the key issues uh, on our agenda with us, please. Uh, you are welcome, Dr. Rizad. Uh, thank you very much. One of the good things of uh, uh, our seminar or round table discussion is to see Professor uh, Alexey Vasilev. Uh, though online, but it's better than nothing anyway. Uh, and uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank him uh, so much for his uh, support uh, to me during my assignment in, in Moscow uh, some years ago. Uh, well, I'm not going to uh, go into details. I would rather, uh, uh, with your permission, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, to my other colleagues who are experts in African affairs and uh, uh, issues of uh, uh, interest 
uh, to our uh, session, but I would like just to emphasize four things. First of all, I think we, I mean the Egypt and Russia have a common vision uh, when it comes to uh, uh, global governance, whether it is economic or political. We, we uh, totally agree on uh, these uh, principles, uh, in particular, the non-interference in internal affairs, uh, the, the central role of the United Nations in solving uh, international uh, disputes and uh, uh, the right of every country to choose its own uh, model of development according to its uh, value system and things like that. The second uh, point has to do with the current state of our economic cooperation. It's okay, things are going well, as I just mentioned, it was uh, 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 something uh, special for me to notice that uh, the trade exchange between Egypt and Russia is more than the trade exchange between uh, uh, Egypt and the United States. But again, I would like to take this opportunity to encourage to call upon the Russian companies to uh, uh, do something about this uh, Russian industrial zone in the east of Port Said. Uh, this uh, area has been allocated to Russia since uh, many years. And I still remember we started in 2007 when uh, Minister uh, uh, Kherestinka was the Minister of Trade and the Industry, and I think now he is the Secretary General of the uh, Euro-Asian uh, Economic uh, Union. Uh, we signed an agreement on establishing an industrial area for Russia in Borg el Arab. In the, uh, uh, it is an area uh, about 30 kilometers from Alexandria. But till now, nothing has been done. So uh, uh, apart from this industrial zone, which I hope uh, you will uh, uh, start coming over to invest because uh, many others are, uh, are working there, in particular the Chinese. Uh, Culture, uh, cultural relations are going very well. I, I agree with uh, Professor uh, Vasilev. Uh, I myself, uh, I am uh, a follower of uh, the cultural events uh, with uh, your cultural bureau here in Cairo. And I know that this year is very special. Uh, we just received uh, a great uh, troupe from uh, St. Petersburg Opera uh, troupe. And uh, uh, I also, uh, uh, I know that uh, the number of uh, Egyptian students uh, showing interest in studying in Russian universities is increasing highly. So I, I stop here uh, and I hope if you can, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, without, I mean, uh, uh, exceeding the time limits, uh, if you can give the opportunity to Ambassador uh, Marwan Badri, who is the former Assistant Foreign Minister for African Affairs, and also our former Ambassador to Ethiopia, Kenya, and other countries in the Horn of Africa. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rizat. Yes, we have already corrected our timetable, our schedule. So uh, we are planning to give an uh, opportunity for uh, a respected ambassador to uh, make a small presentation. Uh, do you want to do this, this now or maybe uh, later? Uh, 
uh, if if we can give ambassador badri maybe five minutes or seven minutes okay it's not a problem we are now okay yes we are we are very glad uh, to see uh, your uh, manas so please uh, ambassador marwan please <clears throat> thank you mr chairman well, I, I might need more than five minutes but i'll try as much as possible to shorten my intervention uh, i'm going to address two issues the ethiopian renaissance dam and the Horn of developments in the Horn of Africa. With regard to the Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, I just would like to call that we are 11 Nile Basin countries. Uh, Egypt is at the end of the river, so we have 10 upper riparians in the Nile Basin. There are more than 10 major dams in the upper riparians, Ethiopia, Sudan, Kenya, Uganda, and several other smaller dams. So the issue really for Egypt is not about dams in the upper riparians, but our issue is with the Ethiopian Renaissance Dam in particular. Why? Egypt depends on the Nile for 97% of its waters. 85% of this water comes from the Ethiopian plateau. 70% of this 85% I know it's a little bit complicated, but 70% of this 85% that comes from Ethiopia comes from the Blue Nile. So a major dam on the Blue Nile is of great concern. This is the biggest dam in, in Africa and one of the 10 biggest dams worldwide. So this is of great concern to Egypt. We believe, or at least I believe, this dam has nothing to do with, neither with development nor with water. Why? The total precipitation over the Nile Basin countries is estimated at 7,200 billion cubic meters of water. 7,200 billion cubic meters of water. Over Ethiopia, it's 930 billion cubic meters of water. Egypt is at the bottom of the list with 1.3 billion cubic meters of water. So already Ethiopia has 700 times more water than Egypt. So really the issue here is not about the 55 billion cubic meters of water, which are allocated to Egypt according to the 1959 water agreement between Egypt and Sudan. Regardless of all this, we agreed to the Renaissance Dam. And we've been negotiating for the past 10 years to reach an agreement on the filling and the operation of the dam to ensure that it does not adversely affect Egypt and all the dams along the River Nile, starting from the Renaissance Dam on the border between Sudan and the Sudanese dams and the High Dam and the Swan Dam of Egypt. Regrettably, we've failed to reach an agreement so far. Ethiopia from the very beginning re refused any international participation or contribution to these negotiations. We did not mind to that, but because we failed to reach an agreement after 10 years and with the dam construction going on on schedule and with the first filling without prior agreement between the three riparians, and now we are approaching the second filling, it is of great concern to us. And we sincerely believe that this dam is for political purposes, not about, as I said, neither water nor development. Why also but not development? Because Ethiopia has been boosting that for the past two decades at least, they've been achieving developments at a rate of nine and 10%. Even if this is a little bit exaggerated, okay, let us say seven or 8% or even 6%, which is by international standards, a very high rate of development. And this without the dam. The same applies to all the other riparian countries. If they have, did not achieve development in the past years, it was because instability, the, the civil wars, border problems between the countries in, of, the, of the Nile Basin, but it had nothing to do really with, with the water or lack of water. Now, because of this failure, we need international intervention. 
Yes, we support non-intervention in internal affairs, but in this particular case, because this threatens security, stability, and peace in the region. We are talking about the survival of 100 million Egyptians and about 50 million Sudanese. And this cannot depend on the goodwill of Ethiopia, given also that relations between Ethiopia and its neighbors in general, and in Egypt in particular, over the decade, past decades, has not been uh, very, uh, or the very best that we wished for. As Egypt depends on Ethiopia for 85% of its waters, it's only natural that we, we seek the best of relations with Ethiopia, but they have to reciprocate. So now we are asking the international community, the United Nations, the European Union, the big powers, Soviet Union, the, the Russian Federation, the United States, China, all those powers that have good relations with Egypt and with Ethiopia, and who are concerned about developments in the African continent and in the sub-region, the whole of Africa and in the Nile Basin countries, to play their role in bringing the two sides closer to an agreement. We are not interested in any military option. It does not serve our long-term interests. We need the flow of water and how to make maximum use of the available 7,200 billion cubic meters of water in the Nile Basin countries. This will need projects in the upper riparians and ensuring the flow of water from the upper riparians to Egypt. This cannot be achieved through military means. It can only be achieved through cooperation. So we have to impress on Ethiopia that the best option they have is not to use the water as a political leverage over its uh, other riparians and to reach an agreement as soon as possible uh, with Egypt. This will only believe, we only believe will be possible with the help and assistance of all, all the major powers and organizations I just referred to. The second issue now with regard to developments in the Horn of Africa. Egypt is a North African country and the Mediterranean country. So we are not really an immediate uh, state in the Horn of Africa, but our very national interest is, limit, uh, is connected to the developments in the Horn of Africa for two, two reasons. The first reason is the sudden entrance of the Red Sea leading to the Suez Canal. The second reason is that several of the Nile Basin countries are members of the whole of Africa. And any instability, insecurity, and lack of peace in this region will adversely affect the safety of the maritime and through to the Suez Canal and also for water development uh, projects in the upper riparians. Regrettably, and I'm sorry to say that, that Ethiopia over the years has been the main reason for instability in the whole of Africa. If we look into the past three or four decades, it went to war with Somalia and it's still occupying Somalia, even under the umbrella of the African Union. It went to war with Eritrea and refused to implement the arbitration uh, ruling for over 20 years with Eritrea. It's now having border problems and possible skirmishes across the border with, with Sudan. Internally, they have problems in the Ogadin region with Somali origin. They have internal problems with the Tigrayans. They have problems among the Oromo ethnicity, which is the largest in Ethiopia. So Ethiopia, regrettably, is the source of instability or the inside Ethiopia and with its neighbors. And now it's extending this instability with Egypt. So again, we sincerely hope that Ethiopia would reconsider its policies towards its immediate neighbors and to Egypt. And this will not be possible unless again, with the support of the international community or international organizations and the the powers that all, all have relations or are concerned about developments in the Horn of Africa 
and in the, in the Nile Basin countries. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much, His Excellency Ambassador Madwan uh, Bada uh, has underlined a very interesting uh, direction uh, for development of our discussion in future. Uh, uh, regional aspects, regional security, and uh, role of Russian and Egyptian cooperation in solving uh, problems in this region. I suppose it will be my first question to the, His Excellency uh, in the future when we will continue uh, discussion with uh, questions. Uh, it will be devoted about how he and our Egyptian colleagues uh, uh, can seek and describe the Russian role in such a kind of international intervention, as you have mentioned, but it will be uh, a bit uh, further. Now I would like to give an opportunity to um, develop uh, direction of uh, Russian-Egyptian cooperation in economy and humanitarian sphere uh, for Natalia Tsaizer from uh, Russia. Uh, Natalia, you are welcome, please. We are very glad to see you among us. Uh, so microphone is yours, please. Thank you so much, Grigori. Dear colleagues, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, let me thank everybody and the RIAC and our Egyptian colleagues to greet them and thank for the opportunity to join this very honorable and really high profile event. Uh, I need to say that the topic we're discussing today is extremely important because uh, Egypt is a strategic partner for Russia, not only for the Arab world, but also for the African continent. That previous colleagues, uh, previous speakers have already touched about. And so uh, I think that, of course, the situation now in the world, because and not only due to the pandemic, uh, is stressing the very important uh, direction to build cooperation globally as uh, the general director of REAC, Mr. Kotonov, has mentioned. To start with regarding the economic cooperation between Egypt and Russia, I need to say that, uh, first of all, we have reached, I think on, not only in economic cooperation, but globally, we have reached a very good level of understanding between our two countries. Uh, African summit in Russia, in Sochi, has shown also that our two leaders are reaching the level of a very uh, sophisticated approach of, uh, of the dialogue uh, on different topics that Egypt and Russia uh, are constantly discussing. Where we are now, according to the statistics uh, of the relevant ministries, like the Ministry of Economic Development in Russia, the Ministry of Trade, uh, of course, the bilateral trade is gradually recovering after a decline in 2020 due to a pandemic. Uh, at the end of the first quarter in 2021, the mutual trade increased to 7.5% compared to the same period in 2020. So now it reaches around $1.13 billion. Uh, of course, the Russian side attaches great importance to the joint projects. Uh, and first of all, the uh, construction of the first Russian nuclear power plant, El Daba, in Egypt, as well as also the supply of 1,300 passenger rail cars between the Russian Hungarian Consortium Transmash Holding and Egyptian National Railways that are worth more than 1 billion euros. Uh, Recently, the Minister of Trade uh, of Russian Federation mentioned that uh, we are viewing the opportunity of localization of the production of the heavy vehicles in Egypt, uh, which is also a very good platform for developing cooperation in the industrial sphere. Uh, today, we have mentioned already the industrial zone, which is hopefully developing, but I am completely supporting the thesis of uh, Mr. Saad saying that, uh, for example, me personally, I have been hearing about the industrial zone for more than 10 years, for, definitely for more than 10 years or even, even more than that. Uh, to say, frankly speaking, the situation is not developing as fast as it might be developed. Uh, you know, time is money. As, we all say in business. And I think we're losing time a little bit on, 
on this uh, economic cooperation, which is extremely important nowadays, because, you know, when we are announcing the projects, when we're announcing some time, some type of uh, communication or uh, signing the documents, it must be implemented very soon. The, the, the modern world dictates that it should be implemented quite, implemented quite soon. So, of course, we have a fantastic opportunity to, to cooperate in uh, healthcare now. And Egypt has suffered, together with South Africa, has suffered a lot from the pandemic. And Russia and Egypt also has built a number of uh, initiatives uh, in the healthcare industry to support uh, each other on the, in this, you know, strong fight with coronavirus. Uh, by the way, Egypt has uh, done, I think, quite, so has uh, done quite good on, on the front of uh, fighting with the pandemic. So also, uh, we have one more initiative. Uh, it's not only initiative of the Russian Federation, but currently the uh, Eurasian Economic Union, where the Russia is a part of, and Egypt also improving uh, the negotiations on the draft agreement of the free trade zone. And the next round is planned for the nearest future. Uh, but if this happens finally again, so it might be a very good opportunity for, uh, you know, for, for, for Russia and for Russian companies to do business there within, the, uh, within this agreement. But this will is quite conservative, I need to say. Again, I'm coming to the thesis saying that we should start thinking more globally and maybe we should be somehow uh, using the opportunities of the modern world and our mutual uh, needs that we have to exchange and support and cooperate in. Uh, the thing is that Egypt is developing its tech and IT sector. It's developing in Egypt extremely fast. And the so-called information and communications technology, the ICT, ICT, is very robust. It has the growth rate higher than Egypt's level of GDP growth. It, its contribution to the GDP has increased from 4% to, you know, to, 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 to even more. And the total investments in the sector increased, you know, for, to, for at the first quarter of 2020, and this was already the pandemic, to 142 investment deals. So under the IC, ICT strategy, the Egyptian government is undertaking series of investments, capacity building and trading programs, digital government services reforms and in infrastructure updates. I think this is the sector that probably Russia is not uh, viewing as a big opportunity for our relationships, but we should do that. Of course, in terms of the challenges, the most important challenge is that there are a lot of other players on the ground, uh, including, of course, local Egyptian companies, but at the same time, uh, good ties in this tech sector with the US, with the European partners, with Indians, with Chinese, but you know, this is the competition. And I think that Russia has very good resources and very good uh, local big companies who can compete and who can come and work together uh, in this developing sector of Egypt. Of course, this is a very sensitive area because, uh, you know, due to the modern world developments, uh, IT sector, technical sector, is very close to the main threats in cybersecurity, uh, you know, in uh, other issues that really very close to the turbulence in the countries and in the regions with terrorism and so on and so forth. But we, so everybody should be very careful about developing the, uh, you know, the technologies. But uh, again, this is then the platform for, for the dialogue and for cooperation. And I think that globally, Russia and Egypt might start thinking about the initiatives that will be very helpful in terms of developing of, of uh, some technological cooperation in the modern world. I would also mention one more area, 
I think space is also very important. And uh, I know that there were some uh, communications and already some even projects started in this, uh, in this segment, but uh, I think it's not enough. Uh, these, our two countries are, uh, you know, sophisticated enough to start the dialogue uh, on the issues that, you know, on the top of the uh, communication levels within the world. And I think that uh, Egypt being also the country of the African continent, and now including the um, and following the strategy of Russia now to build the relationships, the relationships with Africa to rebuild or restore the relationships with the African continent in the economic sector as well. Uh, it's very important that Egypt um, might be a good, but not only, but a very good and significant gate to. Uh, to, to, to the Russian partner. So I think this is probably briefly from my side not to exceed the time limits of like seven minutes or something like that. But I need to say that uh, we have to be more proactive. We have to a little bit speed up some processes uh, on the economic front, that's for sure. Because on the political level, we have constant communication. We have communication on the Ministry of Foreign Affairs level. We have the communication of the, uh, of the leaders uh, on a daily basis sometimes, but uh, sometimes this does not, this does not help uh, to, you know, to speed up the, the process on the economic front, but uh, economy drives uh, sometimes uh, the other, all the other issues. So I think uh, coming with the uh, new initiatives and uh, you know a little, somehow forming finally the previous ones and implementing them, uh, it's very important. So I think we all we all have to be proactive on both fronts. I think. Thank you so much, colleagues. Again. Thank you very much, Natalia. Uh, uh... I also want to, before I will give an opportunity to take part our discussion and contribute uh, to the development of our conversation to our last but not the least uh, speaker, I would like to see uh, again that uh, all of us who wants to um, ask a question to one of our speakers or more, maybe more, you can use the chat and uh, write uh, your question uh, here. Uh, not to waste time uh, further for uh, talking, but correct uh, short uh, uh, questions which can be uh, answered by our guests, our experts. So, uh, and I would like to invite our, uh, as I have already said, last but not the least speaker, uh, His Excellency Ambassador Allah Al Hadidi. Uh, you are welcome, please. Uh, good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? Yes, very well. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be again with uh, such a group of friends from both the Egyptian and the Russian side. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, I've been ambassador to Moscow uh, after His Excellency Ambassador Hezat Saad. I, uh, hopefully, I've taken off from where uh, he ended. Uh, so it's very nice to see Professor Vasilev uh, once again. I uh, remember our uh, discussions. Uh, to be short, because I know that uh, the Egyptian side has already taken much uh, time, I've been asked to speak about the Egyptian position uh, on various uh, regional uh, issues. Uh, Egyptian foreign uh, policy has been changing in the past uh, decade. Uh, our uh, main focus traditionally has been uh, towards the east, towards uh, Gaza, Palestine, Syria, the Mashraq al Arabi, towards. Uh, 
to to uh, uh, to, to, towards uh, Iran, Turkey, but uh, in the past uh, few years, these priorities uh, have changed. And now, uh, as you can uh, see from our uh, panel, from the order of our panel, uh, the situation in the Horn of Africa, our relationship with Ethiopia has the utmost uh, importance. This is priority number one now in Egyptian foreign policy. Uh, our second priority has moved from the east to the west to Libya. And I will leave that to uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Ambassador Mohammed Badruddin Zaid, to speak about Libya in more details later. Uh, I'll go back to uh, more traditional uh, areas of Egyptian foreign policy, which is uh, uh, Palestine, Syria. Syria and Yemen. I'm going to concentrate on these three uh, files. Uh, not in great uh, detail because of the time shortage, but let me say that uh, when we speak about uh, Palestine, we're speaking mostly about, uh, currently about Gaza. And of course, all of us have followed what happened in the past uh, few weeks concerning the conflict in Gaza. And uh, the Egyptian rule in trying to bring uh, both uh, reconciliation and reconstruction. I would say that uh, Egyptian foreign policy, when it comes to Palestine, uh, when it comes to Gaza, is uh, have two pronged uh, two prongs. Uh, one is the reconciliation between uh, the various factions of the Palestinian. Uh, movement and mainly, of course, between Fatah and uh, Hamas. Uh, the, the negotiations or the role of Egypt as a mediator between these two factions have been going on for uh, many years uh, and most probably it will continue for some time to come. There are a lot of uh, mistrust between these two factions. There are a lot of, sorry, a lot of uh, hurdles uh, which we try to overcome with our experience, with our uh, negotiating team, and uh, hopefully it will be fruitful uh, as uh, developments uh, go on. On the other side, after what uh, after the last conflict in Gaza, uh, there is now a new agenda concerning Gaza, which is uh, reconstruction. And uh, Egypt has declared that uh, it's ready to donate $500 million uh, in, uh, in aid to, for the reconstruction of uh, Gaza. Naturally, uh, these two things, whether we speak about reconciliation or more importantly about uh, reconstruction and the role of Egypt in Gaza is not isolated from uh, what's happening uh, in the area, especially in Israel. And uh, as mentioned before in the introduction, we have a new government in Israel. Uh, how stable that government is going to be, how long it's going to last, uh, the dynamics of this uh, government, uh, we shall uh, wait uh, and see. Also developments inside the West Bank itself, in Jerusalem, in uh, what's happening uh, in uh, Masjid al-Aqsa, what's happening uh, between the Palestinians of the West Bank and Israelis, definitely will affect uh, developments in uh, Gaza. So all are tied uh, together. When we speak about uh, Egyptian uh, policy, uh, we have to take into consideration Egyptian-Israeli relations we, and uh, other uh, players uh, in the region. This leads me to the situation in uh, Syria. Egyptian and Russian positions are, uh, I would say, identical in terms of preserving the territorial unity of Syria, in supporting the national government, in combating terrorism, and uh, all that uh, brings me to the issue of uh, other partners uh, or other players in uh, Syria. Uh, the stability of Syria is uh, traditionally a strategic uh, interest for Egypt, and thus uh, the, the actions of some external players, regional players, uh, mainly Turkey and Iran, is followed with great interest uh, in Egypt and 
we hope that uh, they will play a constructive role. I'll speak about Turkey a little bit uh, later. But uh, when we speak about uh, Syria, we speak about also Iran, we speak about Yemen. Yemen is of strategic importance to Egypt. Uh, I don't have to explain its importance, to explain its importance for the Suez Canal. It's also uh, adjacent to the Horn of Africa. Uh, Yemen is of uh, uh, sentimental value for the Egyptians. Uh, Egyptians have been uh, in Yemen uh, and spilled their blood uh, there. So uh, it has a very, very uh, emotional, uh, cultural significance. Now, we cannot speak about the developments in Yemen and Syria without speaking about uh, Iran. Uh, as mentioned earlier, also, uh, there's been elections in uh, Iran. There is a, a new uh, uh, leadership. Uh, it's going to take over in the next uh, few weeks. And uh, this ties to the issue of the uh, nuclear deal between uh, Iran and the six powers, mainly, of course, the United States. Uh, for the past uh, couple of uh, weeks, uh, after the new administration in Washington, uh, uh, the Democratic uh, under Biden, there's a lot of talk about reviving the nuclear deal. The, uh, and uh, negotiations have started indirectly in Vienna, but negotiations are now. Uh, I think this is going to be an interesting point of discussion for us in the uh, next uh, session about the prospects of having a nuclear deal or not having a nuclear deal uh, with uh, Iran. Uh, I have my own doubts about uh, this issue. I would like to speak about it in more details uh, later, uh, as mentioned. Finally, uh, I want to speak about the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, it's interesting enough that uh, when you look at uh, the uh, uh, literature of Egyptian foreign policy uh, in the past uh, two, three, four decades, uh, Eastern Mediterranean was almost not mentioned uh, as uh, it was not of such an importance uh, at that uh, time. With the discoveries, uh, the uh, natural gas discoveries of the Eastern Mediterranean, it became a bone of contention. And uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, regional uh, aspects about it is the involvement of so many countries, I don't have to uh, list, uh, list them all. But most importantly is that now it's becoming a strategic interest for Egypt. The, the, the aim, of course, is to have the cooperation of uh, all countries uh, on the Eastern Mediterranean for the mutual benefit for the for the benefit of everybody. Unfortunately, we have some disruptive elements. Uh, we have uh, uh, an aggressive uh, role by Turkey, and uh, despite the fact that Turkey. Uh, has offered to improve relations with Egypt in the past uh, few uh, weeks. Uh, there has been some progress on some fronts, but uh, uh, none progress on other fronts. Uh, our relationship with Turkey can be divided into three sectors. There's the bilateral sector, uh, concerns uh, Turkey harboring the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, uh, uh, harboring terrorist uh, elements. And uh, my understanding that discussions is going on in this field. And uh, the, the Turks have uh, presented some modification in their uh, position. Uh, if the news, uh, if the, if the news, uh, if the media reports are correct, then there is some progress in harboring some elements of the Muslim Brotherhood. But there's also two other important uh, files with our relationship with Turkey. One is Libya, which my colleague Mohammed uh, Bedreddin will speak about it in, uh, when he speaks about Libya. This is an issue by itself. And then, of course, there is the Eastern Mediterranean. 
and the Turkish rule in the Eastern Mediterranean is not uh, constructive. Uh, we hope that uh, there's going to be change. We, uh, we hope for also the uh, assistance of all friendly uh, countries, including the, uh, uh, our Russian uh, friends, especially that uh, they have a stake in the, uh, or, you, uh, or you have a stake in the uh, Zohar uh, or, uh, gas field, uh, Rosneft has already uh, taken 30% uh, of the, uh, this enterprise. So it's becoming an even uh, an Egyptian uh, Russian interest. Uh, saying so, uh, I would like to conclude by uh, thanking everybody and hopefully I've not exceeded my time. Thank you. Thank you very much. It wasn't a waste of time. It was a productive, productive uh, addition for our discussion. Thank you very much. And also, I would like to start our new talk, our discussion. We have not much time, uh, only maybe 15, 20 minutes, unfortunately, for the timetable uh, for the study of our um, plan. But uh, we have three questions. Uh, two of them are from a colleague uh, from the Institute of uh, World Economy and International Relations of Russia Academy of Science, Nikolai Surkov, and uh, one of them from me uh, to um, all colleagues, but especially to His Excellency uh, Marwan Bader and uh, to Alexei Vladimir. Uh, I hope uh, the team college uh, is also still with us. Uh, I can't see his his video now. Uh, so uh, the first question, uh, uh, especially I suppose to Ambassador Marwan Bader. Uh, 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 and to other Egyptian colleagues, uh, are there any concrete expectations in Egypt concerning Russian policy towards Ethiopia? Um, and also, the second question, maybe it's uh, not very far from it. How do you see Russia's role in the region of Red Sea, and uh, especially uh, possible areas of cooperation between Russia and Egypt in this uh, Red Sea region? Thank you. Well, with regard to the Russian role, the issue is very complicated and it's been going on for several years. So I don't really believe that any given country alone can uh, play a, a role. We need to coordinate between, as I mentioned earlier, and as proposed by Egypt and Sudan, the United Nations, the European Union, the Russian, Russian Federation, the United States, and of course, Russia is a permanent member of the Security Council. So they have a major role to play. Secondly, there is an international competition uh, with regard to Africa. And now you have various forums of China, Africa, Japan, Africa, Korea, Africa, United States, Russia, Africa. So I believe you have special interest in promoting relations with Africa and the escalation of this issue and its implications in the Horn of Africa and in the Nile Basin countries will affect the relations between all the international powers and several African countries. Because if there is an escalation in relations between Egypt and Ethiopia, it will not only be limited to the two countries, it will definitely involve the neighboring countries between Egypt and, and Ethiopia. Uh, thank you. Uh, and maybe uh, the second question will be interested for Dr. Uh, Zat Saad, or maybe to the Ambassador uh, Alain Hadidi. It is about uh, are there any disagreements or differences of position between Egypt and Russia concerning the situation in Syria from also Nikolai Sokol? Uh, on the contrary, there are no disagreements between Egypt and, and uh, 
Russia concerning uh, Syria, but I would uh, take it uh, in another question and another context, which is the uh, general activity of Iran in the area. Uh, we uh, follow, of course, uh, developments inside Iran, uh, and these developments uh, inside Iran reflect on the Iranian behavior uh, in the region. Uh, Iranian behavior in the region, whether, uh, whether we're speaking about Lebanon, we're speaking about even Gaza, we're speaking about uh, the Gulf uh, in general, we're speaking about uh, Yemen, uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, con concern and there has been a lot of misgivings. Uh, one can argue that, uh, and I would like really to hear the Russian also point of view, your assessment of the election of uh, Raisi in uh, Iran. Some have been arguing that there's not going to be any major changes uh, in, in the foreign policy of Iran, because the final decision in Iran is in the hands of the supreme uh, leader, uh, Ayatollah Khamenei. Uh, so the, the, if there's going to be any changes, it's going to be uh, tactical, uh, not strategic. This is one argument. I would like to uh, listen to your assessment. Uh, Personally, I feel that even if it's going to be tactical changes, even if I take for granted this uh, uh, theory or this uh, interpretation uh, or analysis of the power structure inside uh, Iran and the role of the Supreme Leader, uh, the mere fact that you have uh, a new leadership and uh, there is uh, the, the power centers are uh, moving and some power centers have been elevated, this will definitely affect uh, Iranian uh, position in various countries, not only vis-a-vis -vis the United States and the agreement or reaching a nuclear uh, agreement, but also concerning their uh, activities inside Lebanon, inside uh, in Yemen. Yemen. Uh, there have been uh, there's been some speculation in the past that uh, Yemen was going to be the first country to reach uh, a ceasefire. And uh, if, if you follow the, the negotiations in Yemen, it's like the stock market. Uh, sometimes it's up, there are high hopes, sometimes it uh, goes down. So uh, the, 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 the elections in Iran, I think are very, very, very significant with the new administration. Uh, it's going to be uh, uh, more felt than, let's say, compared to the elections inside uh, Israel. That's my humble uh, analysis. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I can see uh, Alexey Mikhailovich. Uh, Alexey Mikhailovich, if you want, can you answer a question from the Russian position? How? Uh, uh, about Russian role in the region of Red Sea and uh, the region of what? Of the Red sea. Russia role in the Red Sea region and perspectives of Russian Egypt operation in uh, the region. Uh, in the region? Red Sea, Red Sea. Red Sea region. Well, uh, uh, I suppose that. Uh, Uh, да, 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 хорошо, хорошо. Uh, вот так, да? Да. Нормально. Uh, I suppose that uh, some uh, problems uh, uh, for the Horn of Africa and the Red Sea region, uh, which were raised by our Egyptian colleagues, are just uh, 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 very close uh, to the concerns of Russia, of course, uh, because uh, stability in this region is very important also for Russia. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, I would not uh, name uh, a country uh, with some uh, negative uh, movements because uh, Russia uh, has uh, 
uh, good relation both with Ethiopia and uh, Egypt and uh, the Sudan, of course. And uh, of course, in, in this way, uh, it could be uh, some, uh, some diplomatic activity to, to find ways and means to have dialogue and uh, some joint uh, results of this dialogue. As far as I know, there were uh, uh, plans uh, of uh, establishing uh, a Russian naval base in the Sudan. But until now, uh, what are the concrete results of this uh, or concrete uh, movements uh, toward uh, uh, the establishment of the uh, naval base? Practically, I, uh, I, I don't have myself. Maybe I am wrong because I don't have uh, the latest uh, news about uh, this problem. So uh, some cooperation with uh, Egypt in uh, the Red Sea area is uh, possible, especially if uh, the Saudi Arabian plans uh, to have uh, a very uh, vast uh, uh, project uh, of uh, smart uh, uh, cities and uh, uh, some tourist uh, projects uh, uh, near uh, the uh, uh, Strait, uh, uh, Tehran Strait there, and even construction of the great bridge between Saudi Arabia and Egypt. Well, maybe, maybe, I don't know, Russia with its experience of uh, uh, construction of bridges, maybe it can participate for the interests both of Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and itself. So that's it. Not uh, more details. Thank you very much, uh, And also, I can see that Nikolai Surkov has raised his hand. So, Nikolai, you're welcome. We have two minutes, please. Nikolai, we have some problems with uh, the sound. Okay. Hear me? Hello? Yeah, yeah. now we yes. can hear you. So I would like to say a few words about uh, Ru Russia's assessment of the current Iranian, of, of the future Iranian policy towards the region. Well, according to our, to our latest assessments, well, we share the, the opinion that uh, the change of the presidency doesn't affect uh, the Iranian policy much, but what we can see is that there is a trend for uh, the growing influence of the conservative, of the so-called conservative camp, because all the camps are mainly, uh, one is moderately conservative, one is more conservative, but on the, on the one other. Anyway, uh, the conservative trend is uh, strengthening now, and what we see that there is no uh, there are no indications that the Iranians will change their original policy in the near future. The only thing we can expect is uh, um, lower tension in the Gulf because the Iranians are interested in that, but uh, they still uh, intend to pursue their uh, very active policy towards Syria. This is clear. Uh, I, I've been to Damascus recently and. Uh, we, we talked there extensively about the Iranian uh, operations, and we can see that the Iranians are very active in, in this country, and they will continue their policy. And uh, uh, the only uh, this, this, uh, we agree that uh, Yemen can be a bargaining chip because it is a secondary destination for the Iranian foreign policy. But uh, there will be also very strong, uh, very fierce, I would say, rivalry uh, in Iraq very soon, uh, especially because um, the uh, Gulf countries are, are also trying to modify their policy towards Iraq. So th that's, that's the situation. As for Lebanon, uh, 
there, uh, I think uh, there will be a stalemate uh, until at least uh, 2022 when they have parliamentary elections, and then we should see. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we don't expect any rapid changes, but of course there will be attempts to uh, balance uh, the influence that Hezbollah has uh, uh, at the moment. Thank you. Over to you, Grigori. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nikolai. And also, as I can see, uh, our time is for the first session is finished up. Um, I'm happy to thank all the speakers and the participants uh, for their presentations and uh, for the productive discussion, uh, which raised a number of new specific issues, uh, which we can uh, continue to discuss uh, during our second session. And of course, I suppose that uh, pressing additional attention to uh, the joint uh, report, um, I can say that we have additional directions for the development of uh, cooperative uh, research. Uh, on the concrete issues, on the concrete problems uh, in different states, in different uh, parts of our region. So, uh, now we have uh, an hour for a rest, uh, and I will glad to invite you to come back um, at uh, 4 p.m. Uh, according to Moscow time and uh, 3 p.m. according to uh, Cairo time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's just sure, stop sure. here in half an hour. Shall, shall we keep our cam uh, our uh, Zoom uh, on? Or yes. To... yes, we shall uh, keep our Zoom on, so just you can you know switch off uh, uh, your cameras and mic. Thank you very much. We'll see each other in uh, half an hour. Okay. Ruslan, don't forget to switch off the tape. Запись выключить. На паузу. نتكلم بالعربية فقط. No no we we talk in English. Oh talk in English okay good. ما شاء الله. طيب good afternoon. Uh, I am honored to uh, moderate this session. My name is uh, Mohammed Kamal. I am a professor of political science at Cairo University and director of the Institute of Arab Research and Studies, which is part of the, of the Arab League. Uh, the title of this session is Towards Stability in the Middle East and North Africa, Views from Moscow and Cairo. I am also honored to introduce, I'm honored to introduce our uh, esteemed panelists. We have Dr. Shaima Magid, who is Assistant Professor at the Faculty of Economics and Political Science, Cairo University. Uh, we have also Nikolai Sorkov, who is a Senior Research Fellow, Middle East Center, in Institute of Foreign Economy and International Relations. And uh, we have Ambassador uh, Dr. Mohammed Badr Eddin, who is uh, a member of the Egyptian Council on Foreign Affairs. And we have also Dimitri Tarsinko, who is an expert at the Russian International Affairs uh, Council. We'll give each panelist uh, from seven to 10 minutes, and then we'll go into a uh, discussion. So our first panelist is uh, Dr. Shaima uh, Magid. The floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, honorable uh, ambassadors, for this invitation. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad, for the introduction. It's my pleasure to be part of this uh, panel and to uh, give some insights about uh, the topic of the second panel, uh, water resources, food and uh, security, uh, water resources, food and energy security. Uh, actually, when we talk about the MENA region and the water resources, we see that um, the MENA region constitutes 
uh, approximately 5% of uh, world population, but only 1% of water resources are there. So that makes a huge gap in uh, between uh, water supply and water demands. When we look at the main um, reasons behind this shortage between water supply and demand, we see that it's due to the huge uh, population growth in the region. Like, for instance, if we take Egypt as an example, we will see that there were different scenarios about the increase in the population growth and how much it would, it would be controlled or not in the coming 50 years. And there were some drastic scenarios that we cannot control population rates and that would increase the crisis about water supply. Uh, also, for uh, the infrastructure, there are a lot of water uh, leakage and water waste due to uh, the old infrastructure. Like, uh, for example, when we look at the Mediterranean countries, especially in the north, in the southern Europe, we so we will see that a lot of these countries managed to do uh, a lot of uh, renovations in their infrastructures, in their pipelines, in order to uh, avoid leakage. However, in many countries in the northern uh, African regions, we we see that they don't have this. Uh, suitable infrastructure to avoid the leakage. Also, the Ethiopian dam that we had previous discussion uh, during this session about um, Ethiopian dam and the construction the fill in uh, that we're about to see, especially the second fill in, we, uh, it's going to uh, decrease the water supply uh, and we're going to have lots of negative circumstances with regard to the available water, especially that Egypt relies on uh, water resources that are provided 80 per 90 percent, 98 percent of this water is coming from the international boundaries, which makes a lot of challenges for the Egyptian authorities. Also, for the climate change, what is, it's one of the main reasons behind of these, uh, water, this water scarcity, because we will see that uh, there are a lot of uh, heat waves and uh, that had a lot of uh, negative effects on the probability of rainfalls, on the probability of uh, using uh, water resources, especially the water, uh, under the underground water. So, um, so this is too is a kind uh, is a kind of waste, especially with the evaporation, with the heat waves, and the reduction of uh, rainfalls. Um, when we look at all these uh, different uh, problems that we face in Egypt concerning the water resources, uh, we see that many of the literature or the scholarly writings addressing this issue are moving towards good governance as. Uh, as an approach in order to manage water resources, what, uh, to manage efficiency uh, of water, uh, water supply and how we can reduce the waste. So instead of uh, focusing on uh, economic, uh, economic or focusing on uh, engineering approaches uh, toward this issue, we're, talk we're talking more about political approaches and technological approaches about how to hinder these, uh, this water waste. For example, one of these uh, important approaches is to do a sort of coordination between different stakeholders uh, in the MENA region, like within the different countries of the MENA region, we, we need to uh, coordinate within each country between the different stakeholders, like ministries uh, of water, ministries of um, a ma a manage uh, for managing underground water, for agriculture, for tourism, for the different stakeholders who are uh, and ministry of agriculture, especially for Northern countries in the in Africa they are relying on agriculture as one of the main economic sectors so there must be a sort of uh, coordination between all these stakeholders who are interested in the use of water from uh, um, a way in a way or another uh, coordination in their regulations in their re legislations in their policies about how they would like to use this water how to manage it in order to have the best if, uh, and the efficient use of their resources the other thing is to try to use some strategies in order to reduce uh, water uh, waste, like pricing water, like we try to do a price recover, uh, water recovery in terms of price, uh, like we try to, uh, for example, see how, may, uh, how much water do we need for some crops and uh, these crops, if they are using or needing a lot of water, we can export these crops instead of cultivating them uh, in the country or nationally and try to uh, rely on, um, on crops that are 
using less uh, amount of water. Uh, also, technology in um, in like in watering or in uh, in irrigation uh, for the different crops. We can uh, the sprinkling, the dripping, and uh, these methods are much better than the floating uh, the floating ways and that are really uh, in irrigation that are very uh, negative in terms of uh, reducing water uh, water loss and water waste. Um, and also at the end, we uh, there are a lot of thoughts about how to uh, change the mentality of water consumption and how to think about water as a strategic resource that is uh, very scarce uh, so that the population have to rethink uh, about uh, rethink you uh, the way they are using the water that the water would be pricey so they have they will if there will be a lot of waste of water that our that a specific part of the population is going to uh, use a lot of water that means that they are going to pay for this uh, surplus of water usage so there would be equity in uh, in water usage among the different uh, groups of the population uh, and uh, also the desalination uh, uh, instead of uh, using, for example, sometimes in some countries, desalination needs a lot of uh, resources, economic resources and financial resources, which is a bit very uh, pressurizing, especially for countries in transition. Um, so sometimes uh, we need to rely on some options that are not very preferable, like, for example, recycling sewage water, which is not very preferable or very hygienic for many people. Uh, so it's better to have a, um, a much efficient um, like policy that would um, think about how to implement the legislation, the harsh legislations about uh, water usage uh, in, uh, in a way that would prevent any kind of waste, prevent any kind of misuse of water, any kind of um, lack, uh, lack of technology or um, old pipelines uh, that are not renewed and they're not uh, updated so there wouldn't be any kind of uh, leakage afterwards. So um, ma mainly these are, uh, these are the main points that I addressed in uh, my paper and I'm open for any questions if you have any, if you have any at the end. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shema. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Shema, for your uh, very interesting presentation. Now we move to Nikolai Sorko for his uh, presentation. Please. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to share my insights. Uh, thanks to RIAC and uh, to the organizers. So I would like to speak more to provide a broader picture uh, and to, to speak about the potential for cooperation between Russia and Egypt in stabilizing uh, not only the immediate neighborhood of Egypt, but uh, the region of uh, North Africa as a whole. Because uh, from the Russian point of view, this region is a region of opportunity. It has a uh, very impressive economic potential, especially in terms of logistics in terms of uh, energy, in terms of uh, labor resources. Uh, well, uh, the previous speaker, for example, mentioned uh, quick uh, population growth. So uh, this region clearly has great potential, but still uh, we see uh, a controversy because uh, the situation in this region is very complicated and uh, the region clearly is not developing up to its potential. And of course we wonder what is happening and from our point of view there are several very serious challenges to the stability of uh, uh, the region of North Africa. First of all we can see uh, continued uh, proxy wars in this region, which are very often uh, uh, result of all uh, civil conflict, civilian conflicts, uh, I mean, uh, between uh, different domestic uh, forces. Then we can see a growing activity of terrorist groups in, in, in a number of regions. It, it is not only the Sinai Peninsula, but it is also uh, the region as a whole, for example, Al-Qaeda is also very active and uh, there were attempts to 
create uh, cells of uh, the so-called Islamic State or Daesh. And now we see, we are very much concerned. Even I mean, even uh, Russian officials are very much concerned with the situation in uh, the Sahel region uh, because because it will also be a challenge for the regional security and stability, at least in the next 10 years. So this is also a, a problem. And of course, we, uh, the Russian expert community and the Russian officials are very much concerned with internal stability of the countries of the region. We can see that many countries are actually fragile states that are uh, threatened by internal uh, disputes uh, or are torn by economic uh, problems or are facing uh, the threat of extremism, especially religious extremism. So it, it, and it obviously creates, for example, very unfavorable business climate and uh, makes this region not very attractive uh, to the investors, including Russian invest investors. And of course, well, since we have fragile states in this region, there is also clear challenge of uh, seeing from the Russian perspective, Libya is a, 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 an example of a failed state, which uh, is now split into several quasi state entities. And uh, we are not very optimistic about its future. Uh, despite all the efforts of the international community. And as you put it uh, uh, rightly, that there are uh, threats of other conflicts, including, uh, the, for example, the internal um, uh, conflicts in Ethiopia, which can be another source of uh, trouble and challenges in the next 10 years. So what can we do? After all, uh, we, we've talked a lot today about uh, the potential for international cooperation. What, uh, what can we do as uh, Mos Moscow and Cairo? First of all, uh, uh, from the Russian point of view, Egypt is a very important and valuable partner because uh, the, uh, the essence of, Russia, of, of the current Russian foreign policy is uh, to build a multipolar world. And obviously, Egypt will be one of, one of the centers of, of the power brokers in this multipolar world. So if we ever want to be present in the, in the, region, in the MENA region or in, the, in North Africa, it is impossible without cooperation with Egypt. And Russia and Egypt can cooperate first because, well, First of all, in dealing with the regional conflicts, with the immediate regional conflicts, such as Syria, such as Libya. Secondly, uh, we can work together on um, the issue of regional stability as a whole, because there are re uh, subregions as Gulf, for example, the Horn of Africa, that require uh, greater attention, that might also require uh, building some um, local um, security architectures. You know, uh, there is this uh, Russian initiative of creating a new security architecture in the Gulf. But it seems to me this, uh, that uh, such an architecture will be very soon needed, not only in the Gulf, but also in the Eastern Mediterranean, where we can see an arms race. We, we also see that uh, proxy wars are taking place there. And um, uh, the, the main problem for, from our point of view in the Eastern Mediterranean is that there, uh, there are no mechanisms that allow the countries of the region to establish a permanent and stable dialogue to discuss uh, the, the existing problems. Then, of course, oh, Egypt might be a very valuable ally in combating uh, regional uh, re religious extremism and terrorism based on religious um, slogans. Because first of all, uh, from the Russian point of view, uh, Egypt is uh, a bulwark against uh, radicalism. We can see that Egypt is a center of moderate Islam. That is why we, there are so many Russian uh, students go to Al-Azhar 
this is one of the reasons. And um, uh, also, uh, Egypt, as far as we understand, has extensive experience in dealing with the threat of extremism, especially, for example, in such areas as cyberspace. You know, if, if we talk about uh, particular spheres for cooperation, cyberspace might be very uh, important. Uh, well, because, for example, uh, uh, our security services, they don't have enough experience in fighting uh, radicals in, uh, in, on social media or, mess or uh, uh, spaces like Telegram. Or, or, or something like this. Also, uh, as for regional stability, speaking about Russia and Egypt, Russia can be a valuable and reliable partner for Egypt in terms of arms sales, because uh, uh, Russian um, sales are never tied to political uh, conditions, unlike the American. So. This, is, this might be an important domain. And last but not least, there is economy. Uh, there is economy and Russia ca can contribute to the security of the re region in several spheres. Uh, first of all, it, it must be food security. I, I don't have to tell uh, the Egyptians about that. So food security. Russia uh, will be, uh, I'm sure of that, very soon Russia will be uh, a provider of food security for many countries of the region, not only Egypt, but also uh, Gulf states and other North and North African states. This is also important. So food security. Then Russia can provide uh, vital technologies in several important spheres, such as nuclear power. And nuclear power might help, uh, for example, to uh, build uh, desalination capacity. So it will help. Egypt to solve the problem of water, at least partially. And uh, Russia can also, uh, in, in, for example, in terms of economy, Russia can be a valuable partner in developing the energy potential. Because, well, there is, the, uh, there is a problem with developing Russian industrial zone. But I can tell you that Russian energy companies have very clear interests uh, towards developing energy cooperation with Egypt. I've uh, dealt extensively with our oil companies, for example, and I know that uh, uh, there is interest. So, and of course, Russia and Egypt can also cooperate on a broad, uh, on a higher level. I mean, on the global level in terms of promoting uh, the rule of law, the role, uh, I mean, international law, re respect for uh, state sovereignty. Um, non-interference and uh, also Russia and Egypt can promote together the multipolar world. And actually, if, as, uh, from my point of view, there might be also um, such an initiative as, uh, for example, broadening the BRICS format because BRICS, but there are no countries that represent the Middle East. It, and I think it is a mistake from my point of view. So uh, clear, we have a very, uh, a very impressive potential for cooperation. And, uh, and what is more important, Russia and Egypt can do a lot to stabilize uh, North Africa and to make uh, to solve this controversy, which I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation, and to make uh, this region, a region of prosperity, not a region of controversy. Uh, thank you, and I'm ready to expand any of the issues I've mentioned in the Q&A session. Um, over to you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sarkov, for re raising uh, very important, uh, very important points, and I'm sure we'll have uh, time after we finish the presentation. Uh, to elaborate more on uh, these points. Now uh, we move to uh, Ambassador Mohammed uh, Badreddin Zaid. Good afternoon. And it's my pleasure to be part of this fruitful uh, discussion and uh, mental exercise. I will try to avoid repeating what has been mentioned before, either written or uh, in, during the discussion. So I will focus on few remarks. The first remark 
regarding the Libyan conflict, in particular the latest development. The situation has improved a lot, but the crisis has not been uh, solved yet. The positive improvement was due to the international efforts led by the United uh, Nations ex-representative Williams, which who was backed by several players internationally and regionally. We consider this relatively positive due to two major reasons. The establishment of uh, one government accepted by all the players. The second one is the priority that the priority was given to uh, political, not military solutions. But the challenge comes from the deep weakness in the same political process, in particular, a bias in choosing the participants in the political dialogue in favor of political Islam uh, groups, in a way exceed their actual power in the society. It might reflect their uh, military power in the West part of the country, but this is doesn't produce a sustainable fair settlement. The second challenge uh, was the absence of a mechanism to deal with the issue of foreign troops and militias and illegal weapons, which also result from the previous bias to political Islam. The last element is the main cause of the failure of the process and the, and the failure of the political dialogue, uh, dialogue uh, in Geneva uh, two days ago. Simply because as all the previous experience showed us that the political Islam elements will uh, resist any election result doesn't uh, favor them. This is uh, which is expectedly high in the future. So the, uh, we can conclude that this improvement is still very fragile. Uh, the second remark regarding the responsibility issue in causing the current crisis, not only the Libyan one, but also the other uh, cases of conflict in the region. I think it's not only the Western intervention who caused those cases of conflict and suffering, but also the regional players, in particular Turkey and Iran, and also uh, to a less extent, some Gulf countries, especially in the beginning. But now Turkey is a major player in complicating the situation in Syria and Libya, and moreover, also in, in the issue of combating terrorism. The third remark allow me to express my concern regarding what my Russian colleagues mentioned about security obstacles in Sinai. Here's the nature of the, the return of the uh, Russian direct flight to Egypt after long delay is my answer to this point. And also, I think we need from our Russian colleague to turn the page because this issue of Sinai in the last three years is not like what was before. Uh, I hope at the end that we continue our deep discussion and dialogue and interaction on the levels of, of relationship between our two countries, especially regarding dealing with all sources of conflict and dealing with the regional players. Here in particular, I will mention something about Turkey. During the crisis in Syria, uh, Turkey was the uh, interaction between uh, the, the Russian Federation and Turkey. Actually, Turkey is now uh, occupying the northern side of Syria. And I was afraid during the discussion before, during the last escalation in, in Libya, in the middle of last year, that we might so see another kind of uh, Turkish-Russian uh, 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 interaction lead us to the same kind of division in Libya. So I, I'm looking forward that more dialogue between Egypt and Russia regarding how to deal with the Turkish intervention in the region. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed, for the food for thought you uh, gave us in your uh, presentation. Now, uh, our last uh, presenter is uh, Dimitri Tarskinko. So please, the floor is yours. And good day, colleagues. Can you hear me loud and clear? 
Yeah, we okay, can hear. Then, um, continue. Uh, first, I would like to express my uh, thanks to the colleagues from RIA for the given opportunity to share my thoughts on prospects for Russia cooperation with my all favorite uh, Middle Eastern country. And I want to extend my gratitude to Egyptian partners and colleagues. Uh, it was rather interesting to dig into your pieces uh, on the matter in the report. Uh, a little over a year ago, uh, when I discussed the uh, structural design of my article with the editors, uh, I was told not to vault uh, far beyond the North African region. But uh, as the time passes, my confidence uh, has been growing stronger that the future of the Russian-Egyptian cooperation lies in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, as well as in uh, more traditional fields like uh, Western Asia, Asia, Middle East. Uh, but I'd like to come back to that thought later. And uh, first, I'd like to comment uh, on the cases that I handpicked uh, for the report. It wasn't easy because uh, they had to uh, feel uh, fit uh, in at least uh, three baskets. Uh, cases had to be categorized uh, as uh, unresolved conflicts or cross-border threats. Uh, they somehow needed to um, connect uh, to uh, Russian-Egyptian agenda and uh, belong to the North African region. So I decided to focus uh, on the ongoing Libyan crisis, uh, then fragile post-conflict Sudan, and the phenomenon of rogue territories within the Egyptian borders uh, in the north of the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, and uh, I'm excited to tell that there was a certain positive uh, progression on nearly uh, every direction mentioned. Uh, it was certainly a fruitful year for Egyptian policy uh, easing up uh, the problematic issues uh, that I mentioned. And in my humble opinion, the award for the most successful uh, dynamic should be given to the Sudanese case. Uh, relations between two brotherly nations could have gone uh, sideways after the Austin of the Bashir regime. Uh, however, cooperation and uh, Egypt, Egyptian Sudanese agenda has been skyrocketing for the last couple of years. And uh, truly in every field one can imagine, agriculture, transportation, uh, livestock, arms, arms industry, electrical greed, uh, even secondary and religious education, you name it. Uh, two years ago, bilateral agenda was all about tension and pressure uh, of the border crisis due to differences on the Ethiopian uh, hydroelectrical project and uh, discordance uh, about the Muslim Brotherhood issue. Uh, but now bilateral relations can be considered uh, a model truly a model for comprehensive development of partnership and uh, even economic integration, model for Egypt to uh, scale up and spread uh, across all the African continent. Uh, development of the Libyan case uh, wasn't uh, so rose-colored and bright in the meantime. Frankly speaking, it would be a miracle for a 10 year long crisis of this magnitude to uh, be mended in a year. Uh, but now we do have a ceasefire. We do have an interim government and a date for uh, national elections. Not that we had shortage of those uh, in the past, uh, but however, in 2019, Turkey decided to become a blatant and uh, undisguised part uh, of the Libyan crisis. And I can understand all the frustration uh, uh, from the Egyptian side on that matter. Uh, but they say that every crisis has an opportunity in it. And uh, in last five, six years, Moscow gained a lot of experience uh, in dealing with Ankara uh, in tight uh, restricted space. Uh, in Syria and Nagorno-Karabakh, 
uh, maybe this experience can be put to practice and uh, accelerate this uh, very gradual normalization process that uh, we tend to notice between Turkey and Egypt lately. Uh, one more thing I'd like to add before I switch to the Sinai issue. Uh, today, experts uh, tend to focus on the most prominent uh, problem and they bust their heads over the departure of the foreign fighters from the shattered Libya. Uh, however, some more distant uh, issues shouldn't fall beyond the scope of our attention, of our research. Uh, in the report, I barely touched uh, upon uh, reconstruction of Libya, both uh, societal and physical, physical as a, in infrastructural. And uh, the reform of the national security agencies is also rather pressing issues. Uh, those represent a big financial and uh, we can say ideological piece of pie and uh, we shouldn't downplay it. Uh, third and last, uh, as far as I can tell, uh, Egyptian government is finally finding the right keys for uh, to the North Sinai problem. Tremendous job is being done considering the integration of these uh, territories and local population into the social economic life of the country. Uh, every step taken factor in. Uh, whether it's about tunnels constructed uh, to connect Sinai to the inland territories or hospitals, schools, manufacturing sites, uh, residential units built to accommodate local population. In long term strategic uh, short uh, development projects at the peninsula, they prevent, uh, uh, they prevent locals from uh, uh, getting immersed into the non-legal activities and uh, presents a solid guarantee against instability. Uh, providing local population with the opportunities to distance themselves uh, from the radical elements always do the job. And uh, in this context, I can only salute the progress achieved uh, in the security sphere between uh, the Egyptian government and local Bedouin tribes last summer. At first sight, uh, the challenges and uh, cross-border threats in North Africa that directly affect Egypt national security are not nearly as important uh, for Russia. But we should keep in mind that uh, Moscow is ultimately uh, interested in uh, Egyptian, in stability of the Egyptian state. Uh, counting all the potential risks and uh, uh, damages to trade uh, and economic interests of the uh, Russian countries, uh, that uh, Russian companies uh, that are engaged uh, in all sorts of business activities in uh, Egypt, from agriculture to nuclear energy. Uh, what is more, instability in the biggest Arab country, country one of the uh, biggest countries in Africa, could send shockwaves uh, all around the continent uh, and uh, the region of Western Asia, where Moscow uh, have been busy investing its political capital for a few years now. Uh, and uh, any large scale crisis threatens to render these efforts meaningless. Uh, so I stay true to the most important takeaway uh, in my piece uh, from the report. Uh, ultimately, Russia and Egypt uh, face rather different challenges uh, when it comes to the conflicts in the northern, Asia, uh, northern Africa. Uh, and uh, certainly they each have a different set of instruments and two diplomatic tools to uh, wield their influence in the region. Uh, however, their end goals, ultimate goals, uh, are complementary. 
that's why uh, it means that cooperation is uh, practically inevitable. Uh, and finally, my uh, last words would be on the matter, uh, a proposition to both uh, Egyptian and uh, Russian um, think tanks and political centers uh, to move a bit further from the uh, Middle East and maybe think about another collective report on uh, uh, that, that will target uh, Russia-Egyptian cooperation in Africa. I think it might be interesting for both sides. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for this insightful uh, presentation. And I would, would like also to thank all the panelists. Now we have almost um, half an hour for uh, Q&A and for uh, discussion. And um, I, would, I would like to take uh, this opportunity to uh, raise uh, two points with our uh, Russian friends. Um, one of the panelists uh, talked about uh, the Eastern Mediterranean and uh, argued that one of the problems of the Eastern Mediterranean is the lack of uh, mechanism for uh, dialogue and cooperation. But um, let me remind you that um, Egypt has uh, initiated the creation of the East Mediterranean Gas Forum. And I think the goal of this forum is not just to cooperate on uh, gas or not just economic cooperation, but the view is uh, to create a mechanism also for, for dialogue and for cooperation in other areas uh, other than gas or economic cooperation. So I would like to hear from our uh, Russian friends their thoughts on this forum. And if they have another proposal for a, a mechanism that could achieve this goal of uh, dialogue and cooperation in the Eastern Mediterranean. The, the other point uh, relates to um, cyber security, I mean, Russia has a great uh, expertise with this uh, area. So I would also like to hear from you uh, how uh, Russia could cooperate with, with Egypt uh, on, uh, on this area, not just to counter terrorism, but how to use uh, the cyberspace for development in uh, Egypt. Thank you. So I'd like to hear from you and then uh, maybe we'll have more discussion. May I? Sure, go ahead. Yes, uh, so there were several issues uh, raised. And uh, first I would like to say a few words about the Turkish uh, presence in Libya. Uh, personally, from my, I'm, uh, I'm uh, dealing a lot with uh, the Syrian file at our research center, and I can say that uh, obviously uh, Turkish presence in northern Syria is a concern. But um, it seems to me that we can draw some parallels between Libya and Syria, and because when, when, uh, for example, our colleagues from the Gulf uh, and from other countries ask what can be done about the Turkish presence and who can deal with this issue. I always say that the only power that uh, or the only party that can solve the issue of Turkish presence is the Syrian government. So we need a strong Syrian state and only this strong Syrian state can solve the issue of Turkish presence. And I think th this will be uh, uh, the solution for Libya and the only solution, because in any other situation, we will see only another military escalation. But if uh, Russia, Egypt and other players uh, can create favorable condition for the creation of a strong, uh, vital 
uh, Libyan state, then the, the Libyans themselves will uh, very quickly solve the issue of the Turkish presence. Secondly, speaking about the gas forum, I agree that uh, there is the Eastern Mediterranean gas forum and it can be uh, a platform for dialogue. But uh, usually, first of all, it has the, the, the current format has uh, uh, two um, uh, setbacks. I would say first, it is not an inclusive forum because uh, we don't see uh, Turkey there. Uh, and uh, I think the key, the, well, as from my own experience of track two negotiations, I can see that the key to solving the problem in the Eastern Mediterranean is to uh, establishing some kind of a balance of interests between all the players because we at the moment we ha don't have a favorable uh, geopolitical environment and without a favorable ge geopolitical environment without political will uh, we can't solve the, the technical problems you know i have a, a profound experience uh, of uh, studying israeli arab israeli conflict and i can see from uh, these studies that the, the progress was possible only in case there was political will on both sides. Now we don't see, and when there was political will, technical issues could be solved easily like that. That's what happened after, two, after uh, 1978, for example, between Egypt and Israel. Uh, th th this is the case. And so um, speaking about the guest forum, there must be, uh, uh, there must be more dimensions uh, because it, it, now it's mostly uh, about meetings of energy ministers. Uh, sh there should be dialogue between defense ministers. There should be dialogue between uh, for, uh, foreign ministers. And uh, it looks like uh, consider, keeping in mind that there is an arms race in this region. We will soon need a mechanism for uh, de-escalation and uh, uh, probably incident prevention, because th this is what we might see very quickly. We already saw some uh, potential clashes e between uh, the naval forces of different countries. So we need some meal-to-meal -meal, uh, communications channel, and we need uh, the communications channel with, that will allow to prevent incidents from happening. And of course, uh, I always think that this is this is my own initiative. But I think uh, that countries of the Eastern Mediterranean should consider, at least consider, uh, the experience of the Arctic Council, uh, because uh, it, it is a very interesting mechanism that allow to at least solve some of the uh, disagreements in the Arctic or in the Arctic uh, region between the, the literal countries. So it, it might be a valuable experience for the Eastern Mediterranean. And we should certainly, in, in dealing also, in dealing with uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, probably it might make sense that countries of the region establish uh, cooperation, not only on things like gas or energy or security, but things like um, controlling maritime traffic, things like uh, uh, protecting the environment, because some cooperation is needed in order to at least establish uh, some, to have some positive uh, experience of interaction. After all, you know, uh, it, it, it is impossible to just uh, exclude any of the countries. You, you, all of them will have to stay there. And uh, so some uh, positive experience is needed. And as for cybersecurity, well, as far as I can judge uh, cybersecurity, when I say that Russia and Egypt uh, can cooperate in terms of fighting the radicals in the cyberspace, I mean that the, I, I'm, I'm talking specifically that the Egyptian experience in that domain might be very valuable for the Russian security services. Because uh, Russian security services have technical capacity and uh, they know uh, quite a lot about uh, 
uh, working in the cyberspace. But there is a clear shortage of experience uh, in dealing with uh, the radical Islamists. You know, there are many aspects to this problem, but uh, we don't have enough experience in that domain. So e Egypt, e Egypt might be a valuable partner for Russia in terms of sharing this experience. And Russia might be a valuable partner in terms of providing uh, some technical solution in case they are needed. Uh, well, these are my points. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Over to do. you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. We, we got your uh, point. Uh, now, Ambassador Isaac Saad would like to comment. No. <clears throat> uh, I would like to thank uh, our uh, Russian colleague for his uh, uh, clarification. Uh, but again, uh, uh, my friend, uh, you should take the ideological background of the Turkish leadership when you talk about the uh, Turkish uh, foreign policy in the East Mediterranean. Uh, definitely, Turkey is part of the problem. Uh, uh, there is no doubt about that. And instead of adopting uh, a cooperative approach uh, uh, in order to uh, get engaged in this process of the establishment of the uh, uh, East Mediterranean Gas Forum, uh, you must have followed uh, the steps taken by the Turkish government, including uh, signing the two memorandum of understandings on the 27th of November, 2019, with the, uh, uh, I, I wouldn't say uh, a transitional government, but uh, a, a I think some problems. Да, похоже, что мы потеряли наших египетских собеседников. Ну, сейчас тогда подождем. Мы включим микрофон. Да, 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 микрофон потеряли. There is something with the mic. I think, but we don't hear you. It's turned off. Dear colleagues. From the Egyptian side, your mic is turned off. We can't hear the voice of Egypt. It's terrible, terrifying. Now you hear me, uh, Mr. Lukanov? Yes, it's clear. Please continue. Yes. Uh, then I was just uh, saying that uh, when we uh, uh, assess the uh, the Turkish foreign policy in the East Mediterranean, we should take the uh, background of the bilateral relations between Egypt and Turkey in mind, and also, uh, most importantly, the ideological uh, background of Erdogan's policy. And this is, I, I wouldn't uh, talk much about that because I'm sure uh, this is uh, your neighbor, and I'm sure you have a great experience with him uh, from Syria, uh, and you can judge him better than uh, we can here in, in Egypt. Uh, from the beginning, uh, Erdogan uh, did not uh, adopt a cooperative approach as far as the process that led to this gas forum uh, is concerned. And I mentioned the two, uh, two memorandum of understandings that were signed with uh, uh, the uh, transitional government in, in Tripoli in the 27th of November, 2017 
concerning the, the maritime uh, uh, delimitation uh, and also uh, uh, another MOU that uh, allowed uh, uh, Turkey to uh, get in with its troops to support the government and things like that. Uh, we, we should also, uh, you know, uh, take into account this double standard uh, played by uh, this guy who pretends uh, to the Western countries, as far as we know, maybe you have a different uh, uh, information that he is uh, after you, where, are, where, where you are, Libya, Syria, whatever. He is uh, uh, the defender of Western uh, uh, interests. Uh, and we were approached, by the way, uh, probably you know that, by some uh, major countries in, in West Europe, in particular Germany, and also the uh, Trump administration uh, a year ago, or even uh, maybe uh, uh, six months before uh, uh, his term came to an end, they asked us to accept Turkey as a member to this uh, uh, gas forum. And by the way, if you look at the uh, the treaty or the uh, uh, the agreement establishing this gas forum, you will see that uh, this forum is open to the membership of any country, even uh, the countries that are not immediately uh, overlooking the the Mediterranean Sea, those countries that have interest. Uh, with certain conditions. These conditions, or even one, one of them even, is not met yet. So uh, uh, when, when uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Turkish government asked us to start uh, exploring uh, the possibility of uh, improving our relations, we welcome that. And we had a session at the foreign ministry on the level of the assistant foreign ministers. But as far as I know, uh, what has been raised from the Turkish side was uh, from the substantive point of view was almost nothing. And you, uh, uh, you know that such uh, exploratory meetings took place between the Turks and the Greek 60 times, 60, six, zero times, without any improvement, because the gentleman uh, wants something that We have some problems with the sound again, I suppose. Some interesting place. Please switch on the mic again, something with the... Yes. Uh, anyway, We've I'm lost sure... lost you yes. on the gentleman yeah. and what he wants. Uh, well, again, as I said, to conclude, uh, having uh, the uh, Turkish uh, government or uh, the uh, Turkey on board when we talk about the East Mediterranean Forum is possible. If Turkey will respect the conditions for its membership. And again, we believe that uh, in practical terms, uh, Turkey is still part of the problem uh, uh, of the whole uh, situation in the Eastern Mediterranean. And of course, we look at what is happening in Libya, in Libya in connection with the Eastern Mediterranean. Both are one front 
uh, we 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 deal with uh, as as a unit. Thank you. Thank you. Another comment from Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to continue a little bit regarding the issue of Turkey and Syria, not only Libya. Uh, Mr. Sarkov was talking about this, we, uh, the only solution to deal with the Turk Turkish uh, existence in, in Syria is to, to see Syria again strong. The problem here is, I'm sure that he agrees that we all also in Egypt want Syria to become strong again. The problem here is in order for Syria to become strong, uh, we have to understand what prevents this from happening. The West doesn't want this now. And the West doesn't want this now because of he doesn't want Russia to win in this uh, fr front. And he doesn't want to see Iran there. So two years ago, we we're hearing some talks about a compromise or a settlement or uh, a Russian package uh, to introduce something regarding Syria. We have we have to, to, to do something to, to improve the situation uh, and the image of the Syrian government in order to have this package. This is one element. The second thing, we have to deal also with the Iranian and the Hezbollah uh, rule in Syria. And uh, the only country who can do that is the, which can do that is Russia, of course. And uh, I think this is, has to be the solution in order uh, to get Turkey outside uh, the Syrian uh, front. Uh, I'm afraid what happened before the experience, I, I, I can accept that Russia has to, to talk with the Turkish side in order to, to make some arrangement like what happened in Idlib. But what I saw in Idlib, that Turkey came out of this arrangement as a winner. And the situation is getting more complicated. It's very hard to imagine now how Turkey will withdraw in the future. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid we will have another Iskandarona in, in Syria. And with a large uh, uh, territory. Ter territory in, in the northern side of the whole Syrian uh, uh, territories. So I think the dealing with Turkey it needs more uh, investigation and dialogue uh, between the countries which share the same ideas. I think Russia and Egypt here uh, take the same position regarding how to stop Turkey, uh, uh, how to stop the ideology that the Turkey is, is using now, and uh, regarding uh, considering Turkey as a tool to the Western interest. But we have to, to find another solution, maybe uh, better than the, the previous arrangement that we saw in Syria, because I, I'm not sure this arrangement will be helpful in the future. Thank you much. Thank you, sir. And Pastor. Thank you. All the issues which have been raised are very important issues. But as Ambassador Ala Al Hadidi mentioned earlier, our top priority today is the Ethiopian Renaissance Dam and the water issue. And unless this is resolved in a satisfactory way, I think it will, this would be a, a very difficult situation. So we will indeed appreciate that Russia, as I said, with other international uh, players and organizations can help to resolve this issue in, because in the days and weeks uh, to come. It's not a matter of uh, medium term or long term. No, it's a matter of days and, and weeks. I also appreciate very much the colleague who mentioned the different areas of, of, of cooperation between Egypt and uh, Russia with regard to food security, desalination, uh, because even if we resolve the water issue with Ethiopia in the immediate future, in the long term, still Egypt will be short of water and our only uh, future is within uh, desalination and securing food security with international partners. I also support his uh, emphasis that to expand our cooperation beyond the North African region to, to include Sub-Saharan uh, region because the stability and security of the Northern African region is very much linked 
to developments in the uh, uh, Sahel region. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Ambassador, um, are there any comments or uh, response from our uh, Russian friends, uh, especially on the issue of the Horn of Africa, the Sahara region, and <laughs> the Renaissance Dam? Or any other point you would like to raise? Can I join the uh, discussion here? Sure, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I would like to again, uh, I mean, some two or three words on the uh, on the Eastern Mediterranean Forum. As far as I understand, uh, I mean, I, I, I followed the discussion between Turkey and Egypt, and we quite to see for the last, uh, I should say, from February or March that you know there is a growing, uh, growing discussions that. Uh, we will have a normalization between Ankara and Cairo, and in the end, we will find some ways, uh, and we'll find ourselves uh, in a situation when uh, you know uh, it's 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 all going to be solved. Though I mean, we were close to that, and we were close to the uh, meeting of the two foreign ministers, and then again, in the end, uh, we had this uh, new cycle of. Uh, uh, offensive, at least in the rhetoric, coming from Ankara to Cairo and Cairo to Ankara. So we see that the base for the current uh, normalization is still uh, not quite uh, uh, quite established. Uh, that's quite you know well uh, understood here in Moscow as well. I mean the Russian approach is always was in the uh, in the um, in its uh, relations with Turkey is that. Uh, we agree to disagree, and then we work together and find the ways of how to deal uh, with each other. I would like to bring a Syrian issue again uh, here because uh, uh, in the end, I remember uh, Ambassador, uh, I mean, um, uh, Amr Musa saying some uh, uh, three or four years ago that uh, uh, it, is, it will not yeah, be for... External uh, players to decide on the fate of uh, Syria. We have Astana. Uh, can you pause for a minute? We have a communication problem. Oh. Hello? I'm sorry. Yeah. Do you can hear you me? hear me? Yeah, I hear you well. Do you hear me? Maybe some. Do you hear me well? Is it better now? Is it better? Uh, could you kind of, yeah, it's better now. Okay, go, okay ahead. go ahead, sir. Yeah, great, great. Uh, so we had this Syrian issue and I remember Amr Musa was saying, I mean, four or five years ago, uh, that uh, it is not for Iran and not for uh, Turkey or Russia uh, to decide on the fate of Syria because Syria is an Arab state and it's for, Arab states to be there, to be present there. I would like to bring here the uh, late policies of uh, United Arab Emirates. I would like to, you know, ask the question from to the Egyptian colleagues: How do you uh, assess the Emirates' policies towards Syria, of uh, again returning Syria to the uh, as a heart of the Arab world, returning it to the uh, Arab League? I mean, the voice of Cairo uh, on this issue is the most important one. How do you see that? And do you see that Syria can be returned to the Arab League uh, till the end of this year? And if there are some problems with that, what concrete problem, problems do you see, I mean, on your, on, on, on your side in, in Cairo? I would not uh, comment on Libyan issue. I would like to also, Grigori had his questions in the chat. If you, I mean, give the floor to Grigori for uh, two or three minutes, he could also comment on the, uh, Libya, maybe sub Sahara as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador Mohammed Badreddin will uh, uh, respond to your comment on the United Arab Emirates and Syria. 
I think we, uh, I will compare solely what the United Arab Emirates did regarding the uh, relationship with uh, diplomatic ties with Syria. I don't think when the matter come, uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> when the, the issue will come to the, the Arab League, I think there are a lot of discussion going on uh, regarding this issue in the Arab League. But I think when, it, when the time comes, Egypt will lead the process of having the Syrian back uh, to the Arab League. But we, we still know that the reconstruction issue and the, uh, the return of Syria as a full uh, and strong member of the uh, international community will depend on a way to have a serious uh, settlement in the situation and the withdrawal of all foreign troops from the Syrian territories. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other uh, points you would like to raise? Uh, or, uh... Grigori, you wanted to ask the, on Libya. Yes, thank you. I put my questions in chat. Uh, so all of them are aimed uh, to redirect our discussion from some international perspective, uh, some kind of back back to bilateral uh, relations. From my point of view, international organizations, international platforms, uh, as we discussed before, uh, are very good things, yes. But for last few years, Russian uh, foreign policy changed and its approach to international organizations has changed. It became more skeptical and a uh, Russian approach uh, became more reliable towards, uh, towards the literal relations. In this case, my questions uh, about uh, Libyan case again, and they are about uh, key strategic and technical differences between Russia and Egypt approaches in Libya. Uh, how do you uh, see on them? Uh, can you imagine how they can be um, rebuilt or how we can uh, work with them? Uh, is it possible uh, to um, for two states to do something in Libya together? Uh, not against Turkey, no, uh, nor against anyone, but for some uh, some basis uh, which to make something like, uh, for example, roadmap for solving some problems in Libya or group problems of Libya to show to own population, to own foreign actors that there is something. Uh, constructive, something, uh, some kind of basis of bilateral cooperation, and Russia and Egypt can offer something to the region uh, as a team, as a small team, but uh, influence team. Is it possible? Do you have some understanding that uh, we need it? Or no, we do not need any formalization and we do not need to develop bilateral cooperation, especially bilateral without any international uh, platforms, but especially Russia and Egypt, in offering something new uh, or uh, reconstruction something something old in, in regional security. Thank you. I would like to uh, respond to this. Libya again, you're, uh, you're our expert on Libya. Uh, uh, what do you think? Let me... Uh, ask you the same question before uh, we give you, we think about the response. How do you envision a, a, a role for uh, Egypt and Russia in, in Libya? What's your thoughts? Okay, if we would check uh, Russian analytical publication, uh, analytical research, uh, we can find some kind of uh, construction that we have uh, in Libya in 2000. Uh, 18 and 2019, some kind of clash of alliances. First of all, alliance of Qatar, Turkey, uh, who supported the government in Tripoli. From other side, we have an alliance, informal alliance between uh, Egypt, the United Arab Emirates, uh, Russia, maybe France, who supported uh, the parliament in uh, Tobruk and also so called Libyan National Army. Uh, we have such a construction. 
we can we, we can be skeptical towards it. But uh, we have such an opinion in different research papers in Russia, in Europe, in the United States, and even in Arab countries. In this case, from your point of view, is it works? From my point of view, as a researcher who follow this agenda. We have only talks, but uh, we have no public uh, open policy uh, of such kind of uh, or, or alliance. We have no such formalized alliance. Uh, so my question is, uh, do we need such a formalized alliance? Uh, can it be profitable for Egypt, for Russia? Can it give to our country something new, what we have no now? So this is my opinion. In my opinion, we have no such uh, uh, good formalized alliance now, but I don't know, do we need it? It's interesting to understand your, uh, your vision. Mr. Uh, Chairman, I'm, may I uh, sure. make Go one finger intervention? Sure, sir. If, if, if you are interested in uh, Russia-Egypt uh, cooperation for Libya, I think yes. the, the best solution will be to wait for the formation of a new unity government. All right. Work together okay. on rebuilding uh, the, uh, the Libyan military and security apparatus. Because that, that is what uh, yeah. is necessary, clearly. Because th they need a government that will have a monopoly on power, on armed violence. Without that, uh, no, I think, I think this is a very a a very good point. My question about can you hear us? Yes, yes, we can. Hello? Yes, yes, we can hear you. But the screen froze. We have, a, we have an, a, there is an internet problem. We don't know. We if still it's can or hear or you loud and clear. We see that your screen is frozen. All right. Yeah, you are back online. Uh, sure. Well, I'm. Um, I'm not an expert on uh, on Libya, but I don't think uh, we need formalized uh, alliances in dealing with the with the issues in uh, Libya. Um, uh, we need uh, a multilateral uh, process where all the countries that are involved or that have interest in in Libya could come together and try to help. Libyans to uh, first to reach a, a solution to form a national unity uh, government and then help them with the reconstruction of the of the state. And yes, I mean, uh, Russia and Egypt could work to get together on the reconstruction. And this is actually a very important uh, approach. And I think Egypt believes in um, reconstruction on the ground as a, a tool to uh, achieve uh, stability and eventually peace and development. And that's what is Egypt doing now in Gaza Strip. You know, after the ceasefire, Egypt entered and uh, now uh, working on the ground on uh, trying to rebuild uh, Gaza, try to help with the reconstruction. So cooperating with uh, Russia on reconstruction is, is a good uh, idea also working together on uh, rebuilding the security apparatus in, uh, in Libya, a national security, a national army, and so on, I think is also a good, uh, a good idea. Now the floor is uh, with uh, Dr. Mohammed Badreddin also to comment on uh, I think we have to, to talk very frankly about the, this issue of cooperation between Egypt and Russia. First of all, we are in the same front. We are in the same, for the same side against the political Islam troops and militias there. And this was the situation since the beginning. So we have to continue this. And in order to continue this, I think uh, uh, Russia maybe needs uh, some concessions. In the, I, I know that they are talking about Wagner troops. And this is the main reason for the West to continue uh, using Turkey as a tool. In, in Libya. So I think here, Russia can coordinate uh, very closely with Egypt in order to arrange for a, a mutual withdrawal for the Turkish and the Russian troops, even if they are mercenary, even if they are a private company, 
But here in this, uh, in this uh, issue, we can cooperate because we don't want political Islam to win in, in Libya. I, do, I think this is a Russian position as it is the Egyptian position. And also, we don't always want the West to come back anyway to the Libyan uh, soil. So I think here uh, we have to, uh, to, to give a lot of support to our uh, civil forces in, uh, in Libya who can actually uh, appreciate that in the future. This is the beginning, I think. And that we have to, I, I heard to, last week there uh, kind of 200 uh, person was withdrawing from Turkey and from Russia. Uh, I, I, I hope this is a true information, but anyway, we have to, uh, to, to deal with this issue in order to, uh, as we see in Arabic, to, to remove the, the match or the fire from the match, <laughs> because this is the reason why the United States changed their position from uh, accepting after rule in the beginning of two, two, uh, 2019, then to oppose uh, the, uh, the during the uh, the war in the middle of last year. Thank you. Well, um, I think time is up for uh, this session. If and I may, our, if I uh, may. Friend, Sorry. Yeah, sure. Unless you yeah. have any questions or comments. No, no, no. Okay, Just so a ahead. small comment. We still I have would time. like to add my two cents to the discussion. Uh, and my, at first sight, my comment may sound uh, like a bit naive, uh, maybe abstract, but just hear me through. Uh, we're discussing a lot of like really complex issue uh, that are pressing and on the matter. Uh, however, as an expert community, I think we should uh, put our brains together and uh, present uh, the decision makers with some um, certain solid projects that can be beneficial for the most parties. Uh, and there will be an example, wait for it. Uh, it caught my eye, like uh, not so long ago, we can all agree at first that uh, the current diplomatic process between uh, Egypt, Sudan and Ethiopia is in the deadlock. Uh, uh, and uh, not, nothing is basically working uh, through the common channels and uh, like uh, uh, searching through the analytical reports on the matter, uh, I saw the proposal uh, somewhere from the Egyptian expertise uh, to uh, extend in the future the electrical uh, grid, uh, Egyptian Sudanese grid to Ethiopia uh, with the perspective to export uh, the surplus of the electricity to Europe. It corresponds well to the Egyptian plans to become the local electricity hub. It corresponds well to the Ethiopia plans to produce great amount of electricity. That's kind of projects uh, uh, I, I'm talking about. It can be like an analytical mental exercise, if you may, uh, to break the conundrum of uh, this zero sum thinking and uh, if we put aside this modus uh, of confrontation and just think that in terms uh, as if the cooperation is inevitable, what can we propose to the other side? How can it be beneficial to uh, all the parties? Maybe in this sort of an exercise, uh, we can find some uh, new and tangles to, to look uh, at the present problems and conflicts. Thank you. Do we have a connection with our Egyptian colleagues? Yeah. Is it working now? Yes, yes, it works. So, okay. Thank you, Dmitry. I think that we can conclude our discussion today. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for uh, all the panelists and those who also participated in the 
discussion. Uh, I'm sure many of the issues that uh, were uh, raised in this session are very complicated and hopefully we'll have um, other uh, conferences or workshops like that uh, in the future to elaborate uh, and brainstorm on, on, on these issues. And now uh, let me uh, give uh, the floor uh, for uh, His Excellency Ambassador Aizat Saad to conclude the day. Uh, I think uh, 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 Professor Lukianov wanted to take the floor. Uh, so please, if you would like to conclude first, uh, go ahead. Um. I suppose no, I have already asked my questions and uh, the uh, best uh, Mohammed Badreddin has already answered. I suppose we can conclude uh, from uh, Riyak, Muswan, maybe you yeah. and uh, Professor Izzat Saad. Thank you very much. As a program manager at the Russian International Affairs Council, I would like to conclude with yes, uh, uh, this event. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, is that sad? Uh, uh, we've been uh, on, you know, emailing each other for the last uh, uh, half a year, and uh, I think we've made a great uh, work together. I would like to thank again the Egyptian Council of Foreign Affairs. We've managed to uh, to publish a great report because, you know, I think that uh, for the last years, I mean, for the last five years, I don't remember any joint work in the analytical sphere made by a Russian and Egyptian institution. If I'm wrong, please correct me, but I think that we've managed to make uh, uh, great work together and uh, discuss uh, the uh, um, prospects for and challenges for Russia-Egyptian cooperation in the Northern Africa. We definitely went beyond uh, this particular topic, we've uh, analyzed the risks. And today's discussion, I think, is, uh, 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 is uh, quite, uh, I mean, the, the qual quality of today's discussion was quite high. We definitely should continue this cooperation and should engage uh, more, uh, maybe uh, somewhere in, in the future to make this uh, um, expert level discussion a bit higher. Yeah. Um, engage uh, uh, officials from the uh, two states. We can we can do that. I remember you said about the Moscow uh, meeting uh, five years ago when the delegation from the Egyptian Council for Foreign Affairs uh, has been to Moscow, uh, and uh, we would be glad to you know continue such discussion. I remember last year you had a proposal to have a round table or conference in. Uh, Kaira, it is well received by the leadership of the Russian International Affairs Council, Dr. Kortunov uh, and uh, Igor Ivanov, who is the president of the council. Uh, they are uh, considering this idea, you know, because of the COVID restrictions, uh, although I know that the countries are open to each other, but still, you know, there are some issues with the vaccination uh, going on. I think that once we have a better situation in, uh, at least with, in, with COVID in Moscow, at least in Moscow, uh, we definitely can think of uh, visiting uh, Cairo and visiting your, your esteemed uh, center again. Uh, in the end, I would like to uh, say uh, Alf Shukr uh, to our friends in Cairo. It is our honor to, to discuss uh, these issues and definitely we have a broad agenda for the future meetings. Thank you very much. Thank you, my friend. I, uh, I also would like to say uh, very few words. First of all, we welcome uh, the proposal of one of your colleagues uh, that we have a joint research on uh, Russian-Egyptian cooperation in Africa. This will be our uh, coming uh, uh, research. And uh, we are going to send you a draft uh, so uh, about the, uh, maybe we can uh, uh, 
uh, extend the number of the uh, research and instead of three, we can make them uh, four or five, no problem. Uh, this is uh, one thing. The other thing is that we uh, hope that uh, before the end of this year or during the first quarter of next year, the, uh, the conditions as far as COVID-19 is concerned will improve. So you can come over to have a face-to-face -face, uh, meeting here. Uh, and uh, on behalf of ICFA, I extend my invitation uh, to uh, your uh, uh, council. The third thing is that we prepared already uh, some conclusions, written ones. Uh, so I am going to send it to you and uh, feel free to modify or to change whatever you want. Uh, so we can consider it a common conclusions at the end of this meeting. Uh, and I don't think we will differ when it comes to even details, whether it is uh, the East Mediterranean or Libya or whatever, because in the end, uh, uh, we are very close uh, when it comes to uh, our approach to the regional and the international issues. And again, I uh, convey my uh, thanks and the gratitude to uh, yourself and of course uh, the director general uh, dr andre kortonov and my great uh, friend uh, uh, alexey vasilev uh, uh, whom we would like very much to see him uh, always in a good shape as i have seen him today thank you thank you very much definitely i will convey your greetings to to uh, Professor Vasiliev and uh, to Dr. Kortnov, thank you very much for this meeting. I think uh, we will be waiting for this uh, draft uh, communique and definitely I, I think that we, we can manage to make it fast and uh, can make a you know, joint conclusion of today's meeting. Uh, sure. Thank you very much again. Thanks. Thank you. It was a pleasure, colleagues. Goodbye. Thank you. Good oh. evening. Thank you. See you. Have a nice Good evening. evening. Good luck. Bye. Thank you, Anatoly.